seeing that we have a quorum, I am going to call the meeting to order at 6.30. Um, we do have remote participation this evening. We think it's only for part of the meeting, but we're going to proceed as if it's for the entire meeting, and if that changes, we will. Um, Councillor Brewer has petitioned, and I have reviewed that petition and agreed to remote participation based on zero, I'm sorry, 940 CMR 29.10. Five. Uh, this will be recorded in the meeting. Councillor Brewer, can you hear me? Okay. Councillor Brewer, can you hear me? Thank you. Are you monitoring for her today? Are you monitoring for her? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just explain that while we're trying to make the, that connection, what we often do is have, when we have the a remote participation, we often ask another counselor to monitor for that person so that person has a way of uh, asking to make a statement, ask a question, or whatever the case may be. And um, Mandy Johanneke will be doing that for um, Alyssa Brewer tonight. Councillor Brewer, can you hear me? I'm going to go ahead and ask that you let me know when she's available. We're going to go ahead with announcements, which uh, Councillor Brewer either has or will make sure we, she does have. Um, first of all, um, we want to recognize that Athena O'Keefe is performing the duties of town clerk this evening. Over here. Um, second of all, on March 20th at 4 p.m., There'll be a welcome reception for the Kanakasaki Sister City Delegation at the Banks Community Center. On the um, March 20th at 6, the Jones Library will kick off their celebration of their centennial. Even though we will be discussing and hearing the 
school districts msba statement of interest tonight we will be voting on april 1st that is also true for the east street school affordable housing project in addition to that on our april 1st agenda um, we will be uh, listening hearing from the town meeting advisory committee who has presented us with a proposal after that proposal is heard we will be referring that proposal to the governance organization and legislative committee for further consideration um, we also want to note that the Western Mass public meeting of the Regional Transit Authority will be held this Friday March 22nd from 4 to 6 that's brand new uh, information to us that will be on the UMass campus in at the campus center in room 168 on the first floor the we will have a public hearing of the Finance Committee on the regional school district budget on April 4th 2019 at 630 in this room this will be a special meeting of the Town Council and while we have a very full agenda tonight um, possibly we may possibly take some items out of order because John Hornick who of course will be here for the affordable um, housing uh, vote is not able to join us until 830 have we made any progress yet Okay, so I'm going to ask and just define public comment. We are going to have a couple periods of public comment tonight. One will be on the schools, one will be on the East Street uh, proposal, and there may be another public comment at some point when we actually consider the um, resolution for the um, League of Women Voters. Given that, I ask right now whether there are any people here who are planning to make and would like to make public comment about something other than those items. Okay, I see two hands. One in the back, Reverend Kemper. Come forward, please. of First Church Amherst, and it's good to see you all again. I'm here to very briefly say something that you may not hear very often, which is thank you. <laughs> uh, as you recall, we were here two weeks ago, and you unanimously passed a resolution in support of our appeal to the State Board of Building Code Appeals, uh, and in large part because of the statements and support of Building Commissioner Rob Mora and Assistant Fire Chief Jeff Olmstead and the Town Manager and your resolution, we were successful in that. So thank you very much. It is really wonderful to be part of a town that has such a responsive and supportive government. And our friend Lucio Perez also extends his thanks to you all. Thank you. Meg. Also good news, very brief. I wanted to share uh, that yesterday, March 17th, was the 150th anniversary of the founding of the North Amherst Library. I have a picture of it, but I don't want to take the time with such a busy meeting to figure out how to get it up there. But sometime, I'll figure that out. Uh, the building that's there now wasn't actually built until 1893, but the original library was founded 150 years ago yesterday. Thank you for that recognition. Okay. No other hands for pub general public comment. Okay. Then we are going to proceed with, and we still don't have connectivity. Okay. The, let me just mention that the slide presentation and all of the other accompanying documents have been made available to uh, Councillor Brewer, and uh, she will catch up with us and have obviously another opportunity next week. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to call on 
Mike Morris and Anastasia Ordinez to come forward and make the presentation on the schools. So I'll start, I'll keep with the theme of thanking. Um, so I want to thank you all for having us back. We were here, I want to say in late January, um, talking about a similar topic. And I think what we'd like to do today is share where we were, where we are, and where we hope to be. Um, I think those are the themes. It's a rather, rather short presentation, shorter than the last time we were here, and then see if we can answer any questions that you might have for us. Thank you. Simple solutions, right? Um, so the first thing we want to share is that um, you likely have heard from many educators in our schools about the current conditions. And, and Mr. Donas and I would like to start by saying uh, we're with them. Uh, we understand how challenging the environments that uh, many of our staff members work in, 180 days a year, and that's the minimum. Uh, frankly, our staff are in our schools many more days than that. Uh, trying to educate the students of Amherst. And uh, this, so we put up this quote from Ms. Fay that was uh, on a letter that was signed by uh, many Amherst educators. You've received that as well. And I think the thing that I want to highlight in Ms. Fay's comment is that uh, truly the, the second part of the clause. They're no longer challenges, but in many cases they've become barriers to providing a quality education that our students deserve. So I want to thank, staying with the theme again, uh, thank our educators for doing the best uh, that they can do under the current circumstances that they're in, uh, which I think is nothing short of miraculous, um, considering many of our educators have been in these schools for a great many years. They weren't great to start with, and they've really deteriorated since that point. Um, for us, the urgency is high, um, and I want to, we got the permission to speak for the school committee collectively, uh, and from my vantage point, the urgency is incredibly high uh, to resolve the challenges that these buildings face as soon as we can. So you've seen a slide similar to this. Um, again, you've heard from us before on this topic, but I know there may be new people uh, in the audience, and, and perhaps I want to add a little detail. So in terms of the summary of the problems that our, our schools are facing, particularly at Wildwood and Fort River, uh, building conditions. Both buildings are approaching 50 years, which under the best of circumstances, the MSBA right now, new buildings built in 2019, would assume that 50 years is about as long as school buildings can function without major renovation or reconstruction. Um, we know that these buildings were not built effectively from the beginning, and there hasn't been substantial renovation to date. And I want to put a little finer point on some of the types of issues without belaboring the point, because I know there's other slides to get to. Um, so our HVAC systems, as you may know, that for the first couple weeks of school, Wildwood um, Elementary School had no cooling. And if you remember the beginning of well, the end of summer, beginning of fall this year, the temperatures were pretty unbearable outside, and they were the same conditions that were inside at Wildwood. Uh, we do have some capital funds that we've asked for to try to resolve temporarily the situation at Fort River and Wildwood, but they're part of, they're emblematic of a larger issue with our HVAC systems that are outdated and need full replacement. Uh, secondly, our electrical system. So we've, another capital request we've put in this year is to certify our electrical systems. They're extremely old. The maker of those systems is no longer in business. Um, fixing those systems is going to be a huge challenge, and we really worried in unsprinklered buildings uh, about electrical systems that are nearing 50 years old that aren't, uh, the, the producer is not currently uh, someone who can come and help us with that. In terms of safety, I just mentioned sprinklers. Um, we saw, uh, well, I'll leave it there, but we talked about the build, neither building is sprinklered, so if a fire happens, we're still in the old-fashioned way of taking care of it. Um, our entryways in the buildings are close to 100 feet away from where the main office is. So there's access to students about three feet in, in terms of the art rooms at both buildings. You couldn't build a school like this before. If we were to propose this to an architect or to the MSBA, they would say, you're not taking into account the safety, uh, the minimum safety requirements uh, that we need. And so we're highly concerned about that. From the educational challenges point of view, our classrooms are about three quarters of what are typically sized. What the MSBA would say is about 950 square feet, typical size classroom in Massachusetts elementary schools. 
Ours are actually about that size, if not larger, but because of the quad system, a significant amount of real estate has to be given for hallways for students to get to the rooms, get to the bathrooms, walk through the rooms to get to the other quad where the bathrooms are out, outside. So we have our students packed in, in smaller spaces than the state would suggest by about a quarter. Uh, as you know, you've heard an awful lot about it makes it sound better with the music. I'm really not trying to. Uh... Well, we keep, I don't know how long we keep trying, but. She's on. She's on. Could we just pause for a moment? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Councilor Brewer, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, let the record show that Councilor Brewer is participating by speakerphone and can be heard by all present in the meeting, of which there are quite a number. Um, all votes taken during a meeting with remote participation shall be a roll call vote. Therefore, all, at all votes, the town clerk will ask for the individual votes. If technical difficulties arise again, uh, as a result of utilizing remote participation, the president should suspend discussion until reasonable efforts are made to correct that. Uh, and if the remote participation um, is disconnected, uh, that disconnected needs to be noted in the minutes. I have asked each counselor in advance to let us know, to look at the agenda, and as I mentioned before, uh, Councillor Haneke will be proxy for letting us know that Councillor Brewer wants to speak. Um, when council when remote participation happens, the counselor that is remote. <laughs> Uh, shall speak by stating their name. Okay. Um, okay. And we will acknowledge her by calling upon her, and the usual time limits apply. Thank you. Please Thank proceed. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, just finishing up educational challenges, um, the lack of walls. Um, full walls that are uh, acoustic, that provide acoustic privacy affect all students, but particularly our students who are least served, most underserved and you know, across the Commonwealth, uh, our special education students, our students with special needs, also our English language learners. There's a lot of evidence that, that the ambient noise that occurs, again, certainly affects all students. Recent study in a neurological journal that talked about um, ambient noise affecting students, young children, seven to 11 year olds, much more so than adults. So even while adults may be able to manage the noise slightly better. Having taught at Fort River, I was always in the middle of that. It really did affect me. Um, what we know is even when students are self-reporting that it doesn't affect them, it's actually affecting their academic performance, their ability to focus. Uh, and finally, on the educational challenges, a recent uh, Americans with Disabilities Act audit uh, showed that both buildings had numerous problems in terms of accessibility. Uh, we knew that. Uh, we knew that from the lived experience of staff with disabilities and students with disabilities in the school. And it put uh, both a finer point on specific areas of, that need remediation and a price tag on what it would take to do that. So we have many problems. Again, I could speak for at, at more length of this, but I think you, you might hear about that a little later in our public comment as well. So the statements of interest. So. Um, Simply put, that statements of interest are what the MSB requires to apply to be invited into their core program, which is what we're talking about. Core program defines when you're really trying to either fully renovate or replace a school. And statements of interest, I'm using plural because there was two that were shared with you, one for Wildwood and one for Fort River. Statement of interest require votes of the school committee and the town council. So what has already occurred is Last week, the school committee had a unanimous vote to support the filing of the statement of interest, and now it comes to the town council to either accept or not accept the school committee's, what the school committee has accepted in terms of the statement of interest. And the statements of interest really are simply put a description of the current conditions. So when the MSBA, when the state is looking at uh, the many applications that come in, get about 80% get rejected each year. Um, they have some baseline of what the identified issues are. And uh, the, the primary author of that, um, our facilities coordinator, Mr. Roy Clark, is here, and he can certainly answer any of their technical questions about anything. He'll be well positioned to answer those. 
And I think, I hope you were able to read through. I know the font is tiny and I know the length is long, but the statement of interest do a pretty nice job detailing many issues more than I can describe in today's meeting. I know they're each 27 pages and similar but not identical, so that leads to its own challenges. But um, they really are a description of where we are. There were hyperlinks to many, many reports over the last 10 years that have looked at our buildings. And so hopefully they were informative uh, for the counselors to, to understand the buildings a little bit more in detail. A lot of what's in the reports, too, you can't get. If you're someone like me, who's a rather lay person on the mechanical, technical side, I'm not going to see some of the HVAC problems, some of the more detailed problems walking around the building. Um, and I really appreciate Mr. Roy Clark's work um, to describe that in, in significant detail. So the proposal. So the MSBA, uh, just to go back for a second, uh, in December when our previous statements of interest were rejected, um, when I called them and said, how can we improve how can we, uh, our chances, how can we strengthen our statements of interest? I heard very loudly and very clearly that what we needed to do is could we develop consensus? Uh, could we develop consensus on some core principles that would help guide us, as guide our analysis as we did, went into hopefully the core process that they would uh, support us in funding? And so the, these are not new, you've probably heard these before, but I think it's, it's just good to restate them. One is that we replace both Wildwood and Fort River Elementary Schools infrastructure issues with one building. Um, and, and really the thrust of that is we need, both buildings are in urgent need. Uh, we don't think one building can last a decade or more longer as it waits for the other one to happen. Um, we have declining enrollment in the district and we feel urgency to take action now. The second is create a school of approximately 600 students. This came from a lot of community feedback uh, on the prior project that 750 felt like a bit more than people were comfortable with. Some people were comfortable with. 600 is a size that the community is familiar with. Both Wildwood and Fort River were over 600, had over 600 students in them in the 1990s. Uh, and um, I'll talk a little more how to get there, but that was based on community feedback we received. Third bulleted point is that it creates a school that's either K-5 or K-6. There's really strong feelings about reconfiguration from the last project. Uh, this is not actually taking a side. It's saying if we're gonna build consensus, can we remove some variables to, to attend to the critical needs of the infrastructure of our schools? The fourth point is creates a warm child-centered school environment. Uh, I've been in small schools that were incredibly not warm, they're incredibly cold and not child-centered. I've been in large schools that are the opposite. And with the talented citizenship in Amherst that would be on a building committee, we want to set a, a framework up front that we would be able to achieve that. And finally, that we'd utilize a process once we're in the MSBA uh, pipeline that with surveys and engages the larger community throughout the feasibility study. That this is not actually the end, it's the beginning. And based on a lot of the process that have already taken place over the last couple months, we've learned a lot and we would build on that into the future. Um, and really this comes from principles that were developed um, as we were considering options moving forward. So one was that we wanted to say, there were people with really strong feelings on both sides of the last project could we identify a reasonable compromise that the community could move forward with and not repeat the kind of dynamics of the past project? The second is that um, we want, could we achieve where kindergarten, current kindergarten students would not graduate in sixth grade from a building of open classrooms? The, that's the, probably the most reasonable, reasonably aggressive timeline that we could come up with. You know, I think I said last time someone else framed me Depends on the age of your kids, how you think about this, but you know, could babies born in 2019 never see an open classroom? Could we make that commitment as a community? Um, another principle is fiscal responsibility. You know, well, we both were involved in the schools. We're aware there are many other capital projects that are incredibly important for the town to take on. We're not gonna stop advocating for the schools. That's not who we are on the, you know, the school committee or on the staff side, but we also wanna be good neighbors and conscious that there are other projects that people care a tremendous amount about. You've all heard about a lot of those, um, and I, the last thing I want to do is pit project against project. That's not how I work with my colleagues at the other departments of the town, and that's not something I'm willing to do. Um, I think I'm going to transition to the educational advantages, advantages of the proposal. And so I haven't actually, I don't think I talked about this as much the last time I was here. Um, but one, I'm gonna just, I could go on again for half an hour about the educational advantages, but I'm just gonna pick out some of the high points. So provide greater access for students entry into a dual language program with a more balanced cohort model. I'll show the cohort model in a second with a visual, uh, but one of the things that we have now that we're spending a lot of time and energy on is Fort River 
is slated to have two classes uh, per grade level starting in kindergarten next year in the dual language program and one class that would be in a, a more traditional monolingual environment. Uh, and we're doing, I think the principal's doing a fantastic job working on making that um, be balanced in the whole school to embrace it. And yet, uh, we are concerned about that. That's not the ideal model to have two classes that are gonna be sharing teachers and then basically one straight-lined monolingual class uh, model. Um, and so this would really allow for more balance um, and also more access because right now, Fort River families have um, a little more priority because of their proximity and this would change that in a more positive way no matter where you lived in the town. Secondly, uh, we have transportation challenges uh, faced by students in special, special ed programs and those on East Hadley Road which were redistributed in 2009 and 10 to maintain socioeconomic balance. The short story is for many students they're not attending their school that's closest to their residence or that their neighbors are attending. And this proposal would, uh, wouldn't fully resolve, but it would make significant progress to reducing the number of students that are bused outside their neighborhood zone, which is something we all care a lot about in the district. Um, as soon as possible, you've heard me say this multiple times, it would get us in facilities that are um, commensurate with the values that we all place in education in this community. And uh, the last point kind of connects to the first around the dual language, but it really creates cohort sizes that are familiar to our current model right now. And I'd rather show this visually because I'm doing a lot of talking and there's a lot of words. So uh, kind of one model shows if the new school was a K-5 to school and the other visual shows if it was a K-6 to school. Um, let's see if I can use this fancy clicker. I may or may not. Ooh, so cool. Sorry, I'm amazed by little gadgets. Um, so, um, so if you look at the K-5 to school, for instance, you'd have two cohorts per grade level um, going up. Uh, and the reason that I use the word cohorts um, is that those, teacher, those students and those teachers really will act as a cohort. They'll, the students will be in one of those two classes every year. The students will mix with the students from those classes because of the nature of the dual language program. Uh, they'll function that way and the English and the Spanish teacher um, in this program will also be high, collaborating at a very high level. In the other cohort, and I mixed it up just to show that some years there's variance. We can't totally predict how many students are in a grade level. There's between two and four classes per grade level, which is identical to our current schools right now. In a K to six model, if, if that was chosen for this proposal, again, two classes per grade level in the dual language and two or three sections per grade level in the non-dual language cohort, again, identical to our current model. So it seems very familiar and you know, all the research I've read on school size talk about the relationships being the big thing. It's not about the size of the school or how many stories it is, and we're not talking about a crazy story school, but just, you know, there's schools in New York City where up's the only place to go. Um, it's really about, do I know my classmates? Do I know my peers? Do I have friends in my classes that I can trust? And do I have adults that I know? And for, because of the dual language program, it really promotes that um, to make an even smaller environment within a 600 student school. I mean, frankly, we had these size schools um, not that long ago without a, this cohort model that were working incredibly well, but this actually makes it even feel and be even smaller. So just to interrupt for a moment, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Morris, if you can explain to the council perhaps the dots that oh, are here. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I've been through this slide a couple times, so uh, I apologize if I was going too hastily. Um, so the, the dots are the number of classes per grade level. So uh, I apologize. So, and there's some that are, right, so in the dual language, it's pretty standard because you need two classes to make that work. Uh, in these, um, so you have three, three, two, three, four, three, right? So these are made up numbers. They're not based on any real right. enrollment because this would be right. too far out for us to project. Uh, but it's showing that there's between two and four classes um, per grade level in the non-dual language cohort. Thank you. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague here um, to talk about the process. Thank you, Dr. Morris, and I also want to take a moment to say thank you to all of the town councilors for attending uh, the six listening sessions that we had. Um, it was really, I, last time we were here, I had mentioned, um, I had said sort of in parting, thank you for your partnership in this process, and it really was a partnership because you all came out um, to at least one of those sessions. Many of you came out to many of the sessions, um, and so we really appreciate that. It made a very big difference. So um, I just wanted to walk us through the process, both for the folks watching at home and here in this room who may not have been there uh, in person. So in December, uh, as Dr. Morris mentioned, um, the MSBA senior staff had advised the district to include a consensus statement in the 2019 Statement of Interest that showed readiness to re-enter the core program. 
And this consensus is something that we've talked about a lot during the, the past few months. How do we know that we've achieved consensus? Um, you know, how do we get to a place where it feels like people, people feel like they're being heard? So what we came up with was hopefully uh, something that gets us started on the right foot moving forward for this kind of engagement around these issues with our schools, knowing how much our community members care about this. Uh, so first we had three listening sessions for the district staff that was facilitated by Dr. Morris, um, attended by uh, educators and by staff you know, uh, who work in the offices. We then had six community-wide listening sessions, which you all attended, uh, who had a professional, professional facilitator that was there, um, and he and his team were in charge of both you know, managing the conversations, but also in note-taking and making sure they were capturing in all the questions and the issues that were coming up uh, during the sessions. And these took place at varying times and locations around town. Uh, and there was a final summary of a report which has been linked to in this PowerPoint presentation but can also be found on the district website. There was information included in the local newspaper. Uh, there was a dedicated page on the district website, a videotape presentation uh, on Amherst, by Amherst Media and made available on YouTube, Dr. Morris explaining the entire proposal. Uh, there was a regular superintendent's weekly newsletters that were sent to families that are in the district. There was an online feedback form that was emailed and posted online, and we recorded the information that came back from the feedback form that was included in that final summary report, which you all have received a copy of. And then there was dedicated discussion and public comment during six posted open meetings of the Amherst School Committee. And during all of those um, conversations that we had, we had members of the, of the public that were coming and asking questions, but we also had a lot of emails uh, sent to us uh, independently as school committee, individually, and also as, as uh, the district superintendent received as, as well quite a few. So there's a lot of engagement. Um, and I, you know, I think that we heard from folks from varying sides of the previous project, but also a lot of new voices that we had never heard from before, which made me feel better because it felt like we were actually engaging people that had not previously uh, had a position on things, but felt strongly enough that they wanted to make a statement. They wanted to make sure that they were being heard. So again, you know, I think that there's a lot that we've learned through this process. Uh, it gives us something to build upon moving forward, and this is actually what we're hoping uh, we can carry through in the next, the next iteration of this. Thank you. So um, I think that you know, given the the conversations that we've had the 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 folks who have talked through to us through this entire process most recent application process uh as well as prior uh we've heard a lot of you know concerns and questions that have been raised and many of these questions and concerns that were raised were actually put into or synthesized into an faq which was shared back during the listening sessions and provided some of the basic answers, I guess, to you know, the most common questions that we received. But we also wanted to share a few of these with you here tonight because we think that it's important for you to hear back, if you haven't had a chance or you haven't heard them directly, uh, to hear back some of the questions that we've received and uh, also hear the responses that we've been sharing with folks throughout the entire process. So I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Morris so he can review these in a little more detail. So. Um one that we continued to receive, uh, and I get the, um, and really understand the complications of, of what I'm saying and the, and the question, but if the consensus statement that's part of the statement of interest uh, talks about a 600 student option, um, why would we have to study or why would we study all the other options that are required in the MSBA? And the MSBA has been clear on two things. One, they wanted us to enter with a consensus option to study. Um, and that's what a feasibility study is, is you study options. Um, and that they wouldn't absolve us of studying their requirement, which is three options, including a renovation of the current site. Um, so there's no conflict in that from MSBA. I spoke to them a week and a half ago just to make sure I was crystal clear on this, which I thought I was, and it confirmed it, um, that we would move forward, we would be studying this option uh, as well as other options. But what the MSBA is looking for is do we have consensus that uh, if we can um, show that this option is feasible, it's viable both financially and educationally, um, that's something they're looking to, to know, that we have some consensus about moving forward in that way. Uh, it's not binding. It doesn't mean that it, again, absolves us of anything else in their process. Um, 
one of the questions that happened at the listening session that I hadn't heard before, but I wanted to put out there because I, I also uh, I agree with what Ms. Ardena said, and the listening session was wonderful because it pushed all of our thinking uh, on questions, some that were predictable and some that were not. And uh, there was a, a parent at Crocker Farm who was really pushing me slash the group to think about the specialized programs, um, the specialized special ed programs. And, while Crocker Farm is a preschool there from a K to six level, they don't, all the specialized programs are at Fort River and Wildwood currently. And if we're making a change, would we also consider it because she felt like her child wasn't getting to see the neurodiversity that the students at the other schools are getting and that there was some loss in that. And would we use this as an opportunity to open that conversation? And, and as you say in the answer, we've not discussed that, but it's certainly if there's community interest, those things can be discussed once we start entering the feasibility study. Um, why 600 students instead of 750? You know, as I mentioned earlier, it was being responsive to community feedback. It was trying to find that reasonable compromise, and we feel like there's multiple ways to get to about 600 um, that can work well educationally and also fiscally um, for the town. So a lot of interest in what do I think is the best way to get to 600, um, and uh, for me, it's just simply too early to, to suggest a preferred model. Uh, all of you are welcome at the next Tuesday night with all of your free time, not being at town council meetings, that uh, the consultants looking at both sixth grade to the middle school and seventh through twelfth consolidation, uh, they'll have their final report and they're presenting it at the regional school committee meeting uh, on the 26th at 630 if anyone's interested. Uh, you're more than welcome to come, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. That's looking at the infrastructure, not the education. So uh, we'll be talking over the next couple months about next steps, regardless of this process, uh, about the results of that, that project. But I know there's a lot of interest in that. Um, hot button issue for our community, uh, add reno or new construction. Another one is specific project site location would be better to be at Wildwood or Fort River. Uh, similar answer, not to sound like a broken record, that that's something that would be talked about in the feasibility study. We'd be led with professional designers, specialists, engage the community on that, and the school building committee, which would have a member of this board, a member of, of the Amherst School Committee, myself, a principal, and many community members um, on it would be making those decisions after hearing from the community. So I am fully agnostic on those questions right now. Um, and that's part of that process of feasibility. That's why you have designers and other people come in to weigh those options, talk to the community as well. Similarly, how green will the new building be? There's a lot of interest in given the net zero bylaw uh, and just the community ethos around sustainability. In that question, I've already heard lots of really strong opinions, frankly, about you know new construction. Would it be net zero? Is that better? Than, right. I don't have an answer, and you don't want me to have an answer right now. We want to have professionals come guide that process to get community feedback and input once people see what those designs actually would look like. Um, so I know a lot of my answers are a school building process pro uh, committee would do that, but that's part of the MSPA process. If we put answers to these questions in a statement of interest, we get some not so happy responses from the MSPA, uh, and, uh, and I think for the right reasons, frankly. So just. Um, Two more slides. Um, the cost implications of waiting right now, we're actually a bit above 4% right now in the uh, cost escalation school building projects in New England. Uh, a one-year wait would cost the town about $1.5 million for this proposal and over $2 million for other most, more costly proposals. So the challenge is that the escalation continues to rise, and with every passing year, these projects get more expensive. And as you know, that 4% is above inflation. Um, so it's not just getting more expensive adjusted, it's actually literally getting more expensive for the town with each passing year. Uh, our capital plan, which I know you've seen, uh, requests capital expenses over $2 million per year. And the longer we go in waiting, the more capital expenses will come. Um, with buildings this vintage, um, these, a lot of these items will be sunk cost. Even if we did a renovation, some of the things that we'd be replacing until you literally rip them out and replace them uh, are really just putting Band-Aids on, and they're expensive Band-Aids, and frankly, they're needed Band-Aids because our, our staff and our students are in schools uh, for seven hours a day in buildings that have real problems. Um, but, you know, fiscally, I'll just say that sunk cost items are painful to ask for, you know, and I feel like I need to do it and we need to do it because that's what our students and teachers and our staff need. Uh, at the same time, fiscally, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to continue uh, requesting sunk cost items. Finally, that in the past, you know, essentially year, and then moving forward, we've added 2.5, or plan to add total 2.5 maintenance and custodial positions, um, and we value our custodial and maintenance staff. None of this is a negative, but certainly if you ask the principals in a perfect world, what would we be adding, you know, with some other um, 
costs getting better this year, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be maintenance. And, and really, our, if you look at our per square foot custodian rate, it's very good. It's just the frank, the frank uh, reality is that our buildings are incredibly hard to maintain. Things go wrong all the time, and it really is a challenge for us to be proactive. So we could think of any number of things that are uh, more directly connected to educating students that we'd love to be including in our budget. And right now, this is what we're uh, primarily adding in our budget for next year. And, and you know, we're doing it because we need to do it, because our staff and students deserve that. But certainly, if we were mapping an educational priority list, um, it wouldn't necessarily be what we would be looking to do. And I think I'll turn it back to Ms. Ordonez, the chair, to close out the presentation. So, um, you know, we had our meeting last week with the uh, Amherst School Committee, and the committee um, wanted me to convey to the town council a few different things that they felt very strongly about. Um, one was to ensure that uh, you understood that every single committee member at this point has expressed a very strong sense of urgency about the conditions at their schools in Fort River and Wildwood. And you know, there was, I will tell you um, something that I saw just a few days ago from a community member uh, who had sent over a video of a leak at, in the, the ceilings in Fort River with water literally pouring out. And this is f following a particularly you know, heavy rain and snowfall that we had. Um, these are the conditions that we continue to hear about and see for ourselves on a regular basis and that we hear reported to us by our students and by our educators. And so at this point, um, every single committee member that I have spoken with and the superintendent and administrators have repeatedly said, we must do something and we have to do something now. The other thing is um, the school committee also wanted me to express that we really believe that we have heard consensus at this point for in favor of this proposal. Again, we have been you know, the past few months requesting and hearing feedback from the community across meetings, via email, social media, what have you. And while people do not necessarily agree on every single detail of this proposal, they absolutely have expressed to us that they feel this is a reasonable compromise. And we've heard this from all various sides of the previous project. And so again, we do not believe that consensus needs to be unanimity, that everyone is going to agree on every single aspect of this, but we absolutely believe that we have heard consensus for this proposal. And then finally, um, that from the MSBA's viewpoint, you know, consensus means a close or unanimous vote from both of these bodies, because we are the ones that have to sign on to these applications. And so we had a unan unanimous vote, as Dr. Morris mentioned, from the school committee, and we're looking to you now, hoping that you will also see the value in the work that we've done so far, the commitment that we've expressed to continue listening to the community in whatever next phase of this application or pipeline, hopefully, that we get accepted into. Um, we are hoping that we can turn a page in the history of our schools right here in Amherst and that we have an opportunity to make a huge difference for our students and for our educators, but we need your support in order to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just explain. The first round is to allow the council to ask questions um, and so forth. And then we will actually move to public comment and there may be some need to come back to the superintendent and the school committee chair for uh, clarification. So uh, let me just say, first of all, I want to thank my fellow counselors as well. Um, I, If my notes serve me correctly, there were no fewer than five of us at every meeting, and sometimes as many as seven. And so we took it seriously. We came out, we listened, we didn't talk, except once in a while we had to clarify when our next meeting was. And so um, I feel like we did live up to our terms of a partnership in terms of listening. Um, the other one thing I will say is that we have also received many emails. I did not take the time this evening or today to count them all up. Uh, and uh, from those emails, we are all see, we see a trend as well. But with that, let me ask counselors to um, raise questions, et cetera. Yes, Dorothy. I have questions about the little dots, sure. the cohorts. So 
the picture on the left, does that mean that, say, for example, um, those children if in that model will spend the next five years together? So uh, it would mean that within those cohorts, yes. Yeah. So, so let, me, let me say this differently. So let's pick on, I'm going to just make it, so let's say we were a kindergartner, you were, this, you were in this blue dot classroom. Mm -hmm. It means when uh, you went to first grade, you'd probably have roughly half your class from kindergarten and half the class from this group would, would go with you to first grade. You know, because we do some mixing of students, mm -hmm. but it would mean that um, you would not be in class with students that came from this cohort. Okay. Yeah. So, so then the follow-up is for the English language classes, which is where there's more dots, yeah. do they have some of the similar sense of, of traveling with people they know? It, yes, exactly. Okay. Questions? Kathy. Um, uh, first of all, I want to commend you on the listening sessions. I went to several, and one of the brilliant things about them is you took us to the elementary schools. So you got a real physical sense of the difference in the schools and the kinds of questions that people had. And I like the summary very much because it's both a summary summary, but then you get a flavor of unanswered questions. Um, so there was a very strong endorsement on continuing to do what you've just started which is regular updates, surveys, uh, as decisions get made. So I want to encourage you to keep doing that. And I, I have a couple suggestions on the SOI, mm -hmm. the statement of interest itself, but I don't want to sit here and say I have some stronger wording, some slightly different wording, and I'm just going to pass them through Lynn so that you get them later. But to as a, a few examples, I think you can make a stronger case that the town is committed by talking a little bit more about the Fort Ritter River feasibility study. You know, just namely, we put $250,000 into it. And we not only looked at whether the site was buildable, but we looked at how might you do zero net energy, you know, some beginning thinking through what this might look like. So we've done some, with a Full renovation, well, you know what they, but, but we started to do some of what MSBA is asking us to do, you know, like knock the whole thing down and build a new one or talk about something in between. So pointing out that we invested in doing that early on uh, and there are a couple places you could add maybe a sentence so it's not a lot more. I also thought this, this piece was one of the strong positive statements that I heard in the listening sessions that uh, this school might not feel so large because there are cohorts moving in it. And you don't see that. I don't find that statement anywhere here, you know, that you're coming up with, you know, involving the town with thinking about it. So putting that somewhere in a little bit stronger that it's in a, like, clause. And then, um, so those were my two main points. And as I said, I'll just give Lynn my comments on a beginning on page six, where I think the process that you laid out was, here's a p possible framework that's a compromise. What do you think about it? Doesn't come out on your page six. It almost comes out as if out of that process these ideas came out, rather than people were reacting to some well thought out ideas. So my last comment is just a question. I thought the work on Fort River and then the work in your space study group on what does the middle school have room, does the high school have room, you know, um, would you want to start pre-funding at least a look at Crocker? So when we're in the budget process right now on a, a small amount of money to say a space study of Crocker, is it built, we would be in a better position if we get a yes, go ahead to know more. And I think that's in this year's process. So it's not in as a request right now, but I think it, again, is, is a strong statement that this town is behind it. So that's, I just want to close with my sense, you could put a stronger sentence that there's sense of urgency yeah. and that the town is behind it and have that as a closing part. So those are just some suggestions on a, that's what I was hearing too. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? Shalini? I just want to speak to the one of the concerns I've been hearing from a few people is the 
the loss of small schools and neighborhood schools. And so I, my default is research, go and do research. And full disclaimer, I didn't do as much research as I, as I would have liked. But what I did discover as a definition of neighborhood schools was having two to four grades, or with, no, two to four classes within a grade. And that's what I'm seeing over here in this diagram, that we're not going to go beyond the four. And so would you say that we're still staying within that idea of uh, a neighborhood school? Um, yes, I mean, yeah, the reason I pause is that uh, neighborhood school means different things to different, different people. Different, yeah. So I'm sensitive to, the, to folks, to one of the educational benefits who don't feel like they go to a neighborhood school because their children are bused outside their neighborhood. So I think that's why I had a little pause to your specific question, though. I apologize for that. Um, absolutely, that we'd be staying within the two to four um, classes per grade level, you know, that cohort model, absolutely. And if there are any specific advantages that we might be losing with a single building, uh, I wonder if we can look at those specifically and then address those. Like, how would those be addressed in the in the new in the new proposal? Yeah. So um, I think you know the probably the most challenging thing to think about is um, there's another change that's going to accompany this one if this all goes through. And that's really what the feasibility study is about, is to identify all the variables, um, what models might we look at, how do we make decisions on that when we're at a binding place, uh, and then communicate that and get tremendous amounts of community input uh, from all sorts of the community, including those who, who weren't present at the listening sessions um, around that. So you know, I think it's a little bit, um, I, I don't want to sound again like a broken record, but I think what we're trying to do is apply for a grant with you know, some level of consensus. And for me, some of the details that you raise very, you know, very real question, very real points, that has to be baked into how the feasibility process goes forward. Feasibility processes have educational, required by MSBA, educational planners who work on questions precisely like the one you asked. And I think that's why we need a, a, a really broad cross-section of folks to be on a school building committee, uh, to be encountering those ideas, thinking about it. And, and also think about some of the benefits, right? So I think you described you know, uh, a concern that you have or you've heard about the size of schools. I think one of the other, challenge, one of the other advantages is when we think about uh, alignment of curricula and materials and supply, like there's some real advantages to having um, some economy of scale. So I think it, it cuts both ways and that's what we would really be studying in the feasibility study. And it's not just about where the bricks go or new construction versus ad reno, actually what you have to submit has to go through. The school committee is an educational plan to define uh, how you're going to make whatever it is, whatever model you want to have, how that's going to work and how you're going to mitigate any challenges that come up educationally. And so really the way it process, it would process that we would use is that the educational consultant who's part of the architectural team would work with a broad cross section of stakeholders, including staff, to work on a document that actually gets voted at school committee and then submitted to the MSBA and is a required element of their feasibility process. Sorry, that was long winded. Okay. Additional questions or comments? Pat. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Fort River uh, feasibility meetings, uh, and I was impressed by the fact that the uh, committee was diverse. It came from all of the schools. There were um, and I was sort of proud of the people that were getting together and hashing out these issues. I'm hoping and I, I'm assuming in a positive sense that that was also true of the Wildwood field feasibility study. So there's a certain way in which we've been, been building consensus for a longer period of time. Uh, and I think if there's some way to really state that also to go back. The, even the dual language program is a result of the failed co-located schools because we've talked about it for a long time, but we made it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for making that, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Additional comments? Darcy? I would just um, endorse <clears throat> both Kathy and Pat's uh, comments, and um, uh, I am hoping that in the, the feasibility study is going to be uh, a mean, it's going to go to all households in some way or another um, because um, I really feel the need to make sure that the 
whole town is behind this, that we have real consensus, that it's a full and meaningful process, and that people are given the chance to look at different cost comparisons so that they can understand why uh, it, you know, uh, what looks like a majority of people have agreed on this. I mean, we, we don't know that yet because we haven't contacted everyone, but um, uh, I think that uh, we just need to get more information out to people so that they can compare all the different options and see uh, what the merits of this one are. Mandy Joe. So I, I just want to thank you for one of your earlier slides that talked about um, the, the feasibility study and the requirement that will still be there to investigate more than just this proposed solution because one of the biggest concerns I've heard um, throughout this process is that it might foreclose some options or this proposal potentially forecloses some options that might be necessary depending on all of the unknowns that we know. So I, I thank you for making clear that it does not at this point foreclose those options because we don't know so much about what would need to go into during a feasibility study, things to get us to that, the current proposed five agreements. Other comments? I want to make sure that we all clearly understand the goal is to get the funding for the feasibility study, which also then puts us in the queue. And getting to the queue is where the long-term prize is, okay? Which is to get the state money for whatever we decide to do, okay? Want to make sure, just put it out there in layman's language, okay? Um, are there other questions from the council? We have a very robust audience here with some of our notable leaders from our school district, as well as students, teachers, and other people. So I'd like to see a show of hands, <laughs> and I'm going to have to stand up to count or ask Mr. Bachman to help me, of all of the people who would like to make public comment. Okay. So I, we see approximately 20. If we went with, I'm sorry? Yes, I will. Oh, that's right. Yeah, don't worry. Teachers, I will. With a suggestion, I've got that down, okay? Got <laughs> <laughs> that's what I love about this council. <laughs> um, so if we go with three minutes, that means we have 60 minutes of comment. Perhaps we have, can figure out a way to do that less. At the same time, we really don't want to prohibit the discussion and I also want to point out that we do have another discussion or if you will a vote on this in two weeks uh, but what we would like to do is to ask those people who are either students or teachers because we know you have an early day tomorrow and we'd like to give them the opportunity to go first so <laughs> We have one very eager, one eager yes. volunteer to come forward. Um, good evening. Please um, state my, your name. My name is Joya Woods. And, and I am, where you live and where you work. I actually live in Chicopee. That's okay. But I work at Wildwood. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm a fourth grade teacher at Wildwood and have been so for over 12 years. Um, I, I have had the opportunity the fortunate opportunity to be a part of a great community of educators and learners coupled with the unfortunate issue of being exposed to a number of issues that the Wildwood Building has. 
About seven years ago, I was located in a classroom that I was having a severe allergic reaction to. I was consistently itchy, uncomfortable, and gradually developed pandemic eczema. I went further to have symptoms evaluated and tested. The results came back as being allergic to mold, mildew, and dust mites. As a result of these findings, I was moved to a classroom with no carpet and run an air purifier consistently, which I still continue to do to this day. This room that I was referring to now is currently known to be one of the rooms that has one of the highest levels of carbon dioxide. The teacher who resides in that room now suffers from chronic sinus issues and often has headaches. I share this personal experience to say that as a member of the Wildwood community that cares about our population of learners and educators, it has been time towards making a change. There has been consistent evidence throughout the years, whether it be observational in nature or experienced as a health issue, which demonstrates the immediate need for learning spaces that are healthy and actually conducive to learning. We have some wonderful custodians and administrators and others doing the best they can to mitigate the situations as they arise, but it is not enough. Oftentimes, those of us that are removed from the situation can sympathize in the moment, but may forget that these are our, child our children, families and friends that experience challenging conditions on a daily basis. Too often, it takes a severe situation for a call to action, which then thrusts us as a community into reactionary mode. I would encourage you this evening to assume a more proactive stance, one that thinks of students of Wildwood and Fort River as our children, and teachers and administrators as our educators, that we are a village taking into account all voices, and thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you for your comments. Next, please. We, just so you know, the council does not comment back. It's not that we're not listening. Hi there. Hi. My Hello. name is Diane Chamberlain. And I'm Nick Yaffe. And we came intentionally My as a trio. <laughs> <laughs> we came intentionally as a trio representing the administration of the three schools. I live in Leverett, but um, as the, I'm the principal at Fort River School. And I'm the principal of Wildwood School. Uh, I'm the principal of Cocker Farm School. And I was just uh, talking to my colleagues there, and we tallied up that between us, we've got 67 years of experience working in the Amherst schools <laughs> and approximately 90 years, um, not one of us, all three of us, uh, <laughs> working in education. So I don't think we need to present any new evidence to you, but I think what we wanted to make clear is that the situation that we have now is untenable. And we know it does not allow our students to achieve at their greatest extent possible. And I'd like to commend our faculty and staff for doing an outstanding job educating our children under circumstances that are far less than ideal. But it is time that we move forward the statement of interest because as you noted, it gets us in a queue. It doesn't make an instant gratification kind of situation evolve from what for us. It's gonna be a long process and we can't wait any longer. Our children's futures are really in need of dire need of support. And the thing that I've thought about a lot is, is you're gonna hear for the rest of this, for the next hour, is how immediate the situation is. This is a situation that needs to be dealt with now. Um, this is, as Joya just said, our educators need this, our students need this, and we are primed to continue to do even more exciting things in our buildings, but the buildings themselves cannot sustain what we want to do in terms of the project-based learning or really hands-on work that we're doing with our students. The second thing I want to make a point about is, is I know there are concerns about building community. And that's something that I want the people of Amherst to trust that we can do. This is something that as educators, we have done this. We've done this through a shift already, nine years ago, I think almost, uh, in, in the redistricting. And it's something that we will work really hard to create a new vibrant community with a 600 student school, that you can build small communities within a larger community. Yeah. Again, my name is uh, Derek Shea. I've, I've lived here in town for 24 years. I've uh, worked for the schools for 22. Um, I would just reiterate, I would say two quick things, but just what Nick was saying here, that um, the, the notion of a, of a 575 or a 600 student school doesn't frighten me in the slightest. Um, and I go back to, I've known Lynn for quite some time, I go back to Fort River days when I worked there way back in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, and we had approximately 575, 600 students. And I can say for sure that there was a large number of pe people in the building, including myself, I think, 
who knew every single student and knew something about every single family who came into the building. Uh, and we certainly made that happen, I think, in a beautiful way. Um, I would just say this. So I'm the principal at Crocker Farm School. And, and I shall tell you that we are not without our warts and struggles as well sometimes. Uh, we could certainly bring the same photographs with the water coming from the, the roof in, in, in recent weeks. Um, but we are in a slightly different position, right? You, you, you can come to our school any time in the morning and, and, and the buses will drive up and you'll see a, a large number of students very excitedly sort of getting ready to go play in our playground and, and have a wonderful bright start to the day. They will then proceed to go to a classroom where every single classroom in our building has a beautiful big picture window, right? There's four walls. There's a door where you can connect to the next classroom if you want to go next door and connect with, <laughs> with, with other people. Um, you can come and have lunch with us in our cafeteria. And again, it's not completely 21st century, but it is beautiful. It's got a huge, big cathedral ceiling. So if you want to have 140 students to sit and have lunch together, they can talk with one another without it sounding like it's too loud and without maybe teachers or counselors myself saying, please stop talking, please be quiet. Well, you shouldn't be quiet because you're at lunch. Have a good time and talk with one another. But we've got this beautiful, big, ginormous ceiling that allows that to happen. So I think I can say with almost certainty, and we do have some warts that we would like to fix, at Crocker Farm School, our students, our teachers, and our families really like to come every day. I think they feel like there's a bright future when you come there every day. And partly, it's because of the physical shape of the building and how beautiful it is. Again, my kids went to Mark's Meadow. They went to Wildwood. I know a little bit about Wildwood. I was at the high school, Crocker Farm. We certainly need a new school. It's not, I, I think, something that is just a, a wish. It's something that I think we need. I want you to thank you very much for letting us talk, even early, uh, so we can go home and go to sleep. <laughs> <I> <laughs> thank really, you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hello? Is it? Oh, it's on. Okay. <laughs> um, my name's Julian Hines, and... We live on 54 High Street in Amherst. And I would say my first comment is that this is an issue that no matter really what way to look at it, there's a lot of people on the different sides of the issues who both have really good points. And I think the most important thing is that from some of my teachers back there to um, myself and most of the townspeople, we all, no matter which side of the issue we fall on, care that something needs to be done for our children, including myself, who previously attended Fort River. So I personally am on the against side of building this new school, simply because of small details, for the first part, small details, like how there's the bus loop in the new design of the new proposed school at Wildwood. You have the bus loop, and then you have a hard surface play area for like four square and basketball in that bus loop. Those are small things that are fine, but in, that need to be changed. But there's a lot of those little details that make for an unsafe situation in and of itself, where you have three or four buses all in the circle and then you have the kids trying to cross through the buses. Like, it's not a good idea. So that's my first thing. And then my second thing is that would we, I want to make sure we build a building that doesn't last us 50 years because our old buildings are only 40 years old and we're discussing about replacing them. Where... This town hall building and my house were built in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, and are still standing without any of the issues that the schools have. So I want to make sure we build, if we build a new school, we build one that has, that has, that doesn't last us only 40 years, <laughs> that lasts us 100 or 200 years. Um, so I think that is an important thing that we need to think about planning for, both for so we don't end up in a situation as quickly where the students are uncomfortable in their own building, and we also don't end up in a situation where 
we have to build a new school <laughs> in 40 or 50 years. So just consider that when you vote on this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. My name's Jean Fay. I am a resident of the town of Amherst. I am also an, a paraeducator working in the Amherst public school system. This is my 21st year. And I am also the president of the Amherst Pelham Education Association. Those that know me know in my role as president that I advocate strongly for the members that I represent. But those that know me really well know that I also advocate for the children and the students of this town. And one of the things that I have heard regarding this proposal is that we can wait. What I want you to imagine is being, I want you to imagine being a student who is differently abled and cannot access the same educational opportunities as their peers and being told as that student that they can wait. I want you to imagine being a student who has a respiratory issue and being told that in a building that has air quality issues that they can wait to have a safe building that they can wait to have clean air. We can't wait. Our buildings are being held together with band-aids. Our maintenance staff are doing their best to keep the buildings upright and to keep the buildings open. We're running out of band-aids. Our students deserve the best education that we can provide, all students. It should not matter what your address is, whether you have access to a quality education in a safe and healthy building. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Nicole Singer, and I am the art teacher at Fort River. Um, there is one classroom of the more than 20 classrooms at Fort River, there is one classroom where it is possible for a student to listen to a single sound at a time. Um, this is also the only classroom that has four walls, full, full real walls, um, and windows, and ventilation, and storage. This is a room that they only spend 40 minutes a week in because it is the art room, and I'm lucky that it's mine. Um, I want to see all of my students enjoy the rest of the building the way that they enjoy the art room, and learn in the rest of the building the way that they learn in the art room. Up until recently, the art room was also the only room in the building that didn't have some kind of leak happening, but um, a bunch of months ago, part of my ceiling caved in, and I'm grateful that it caved in over our several thousand dollar electric kiln instead of over the students or their artwork. Um, to, to have to be grateful for that kind of happening uh, is very difficult <laughs> and awkward to explain to the students. Um, and I, I know that there are many, many details to be worked out along the way about outreach to the whole community, about um, all the different possible plans uh, physically and architecturally for this building, um, but I'm here to urge the council to please move forward with the SOI and with consensus as quick as we can. Um, it's what we need to make all of our classrooms as good as our one little art room where the kids only spend a precious 40 minutes a week, um, and hopefully none of them will have leaks then either. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Lori Hickson. I teach first grade at Fort River. Um, I've been there for 31 years. And in the time that I've been teaching at Fort River, since 1988, there were many health concerns that I heard about when I arrived. Mold growth and roof leaks and air quality and noise levels and space concerns and rodent infestation. And some of these issues have been temporarily controlled over the years, but never rectified completely. Our custodians and maintenance staff are truly our superheroes. When the roof leaks, they rush to catch the water, they replace the ceiling tiles, they scrub the mold growth. 
When something breaks, they work overtime to fix it so we can live in our classrooms the next day. They set and remove rodent traps when we're out of the room. They make sure the bathroom drain issues are plunged. And for over 30 years, we've been learning and working in a building that may look okay when you come through for a short tour. Of course, if you stayed a while, especially on a rainy day, you might see the real issues. We can say that it's fine to wait, but these issues have been really there for a very long time. We don't think that perhaps waiting more would really solve a problem. And so I'm asking you to please understand that although I will never work in the new building, our children deserve it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there additional comments from teachers, students, and personnel from the schools? I'm Kristen Roeder. I teach sixth grade at Wildwood and I live in Amherst. I've been teaching at Wildwood for about 10 years. And I, I don't want to repeat a lot of what people have been saying, but at the same time, it might be good to hear it, you know, from a different perspective. So um, a few years ago, myself and a few colleagues wrote a letter to the editor of the bulletin um, about the condition of Wildwood and our concerns about that. I think around 50 people signed that letter, you know, showing concern. Um, I have had pneumonia four times since I've worked at Wildwood um, in the classroom that I'm in. I never had pneumonia before that. And I also heard that the teacher before me also had pneumonia repeatedly in that room. Um, so, you know, that concerns me in terms of myself and other teachers and the students. Today, when I was teaching English, um, students were reading their stories out loud, but we couldn't really hear them because next door in one class, they're running the science fair. In the other class, there was a substitute, so it was a little louder than usual. And that's pretty much what happens every day. So I tell kids, you know, you have to use your recess voice now. But some kids, are, they don't access their recess voice very well. Um, over the years, I've had student teachers. And sometimes when I've had student teachers, I've sat in the back of the room and observed what goes on in my class, but in the back of the room, I'm almost as close to the other room with the open doors. So it's really hard to screen out what the other teachers saying in the other room or what the other kids are doing and really focus in on what's happening in my classroom. So again, I'd like to urge you to proceed because um, all these things happen every day and it concerns a lot of us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Additional teachers, school personnel. Then may we have people who are here who would also like to speak to the school issue come forward. Sir? Yes. My name is Brian Scully, and my daughter is a student at Fort River. There's a problem in both Fort River and Wildwood Elementary Schools that has been hurting our children in heartbreaking ways for almost 50 years. It's not as obvious as a bad roof or mold or poor air quality. It's the open-walled classrooms that allow the sounds and voices from one classroom to bellow over to another classroom. It creates noisy distractions and an obstacle to learning for many children that I have experienced myself. At my daughter's fourth grade open house, while I was trying to listen to her teacher tell us what his plan was for the coming year, I could also hear the teacher in the next classroom telling those parents his plan. The voices and sounds coming from that other classroom created a distraction, and I missed about half of what my daughter's teacher said. And that was with two rooms full of semi-well-behaved parents <laughs> Not, not two classes of active 10-year-olds, all talking, asking questions, and making the usual kid noises. Some children are able to overcome the distractions from the open walls while a lesson is being taught. But what about the kids who can't overcome them 
and are not able to focus on what their teacher is teaching. They go home not having understood the day's lessons because they couldn't ignore the distractions and they fall behind. And you know what the heartbreaking part is? Those kids don't blame the open walls. They blame themselves because they couldn't learn the stuff that some other kids could learn. They feel like they're not as smart as everybody else, not as good as everybody else. And those are terrible things for any child to feel, and they're not true. We tell our children that they can be anything they want to be if they study and work hard enough. Some may want to be a veterinarian or an astronaut or maybe even Wonder Woman. Well, those kids are studying and working hard enough, but some can't overcome these open wall obstacles to learning that we have put in front of them. And that's when they begin to lose their confidence in themselves and their love of learning. Don't let our children's dreams die in these open walled classrooms. Please vote yes for every elementary school kid at Amherst, especially the little ones who are in preschool now and already starting to dream of they, what they want to be when they grow up. The world can always use another Wonder Woman. Thank you for your comments. Uh, good evening, I'm Catherine Oppie. I am co-chair of Amherst Forward along with Ginny Hamilton. I'm a former school committee member and a one-time Wildwood parent. I fully support this proposal for a single child-centered school building with windows and walls to replace both Wildwood and Fort River. Like many people in town, I recognize this proposal as a compromise one that can't possibly meet everyone's highest hopes, including mine. Someone who has been involved in the details of this issue for years. I also understand the injustice of keeping two-thirds of our school children, teachers, and staff in buildings that the president of the Amherst Pelham Education Association says are barriers to learning. And even apart from the horrible infrastructure there's the open classroom design, which causes significant noise pollution and regular instructional interruptions, making it harder for all children's learning, but especially our most vulnerable students. Having been a Wildwood parent, as Brian has pointed out, and I've been in that situation, I know from my own experience that any time I was in a classroom, I struggled to hear teachers teach and students present their work. I also want to support our educators who do amazing work with our children every day. We trust them to educate our children. Let's also trust their calls of urgency about the inadequacy of our current school buildings. I think this town council needs to send a unanimous message to the MSBA. Let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and the just. The need for a new school or renovated school building is long past due. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mike Hanke, I'm a resident of Gray Street. I feel like I'm at the helm of the Starship Enterprise. I'm just hoping that you are not Romulans or Klingons. Uh, I, uh, I have a, a different view about, about capital projects, and they're not all created equal. I, I, I'll say what uh, Dr. Morris, who I have a great growing respect for, uh, and maybe what the town manager would disagree with, but I believe in triage. And uh, when you come into a hospital with a skinned knee or a broken arm or you're suffering a major massive heart attack, who gets treated first? Well. Both Fort River and Wildwood are having massive heart attacks. So I'm a designer, and as a designer who has spent countless hours inside Wildwood school, I've spent over 100 hours because both my kids attended. I enthusiastically endorsed the proposed plan for new grade school to replace Fort River and Wildwood schools. Decades of neglect have eroded all of our school buildings at Fort River, Wildwood, and the middle school in the most decrepit condition. One reason for this neglect might be high operational costs of our schools, which diminishes the appetite for capital spending, but that does not excuse the decades of shameful neglect. Now there's a myth of neighborhood schools. Some insist that Wildwood and Fort River are neighborhood schools. The facts do not bear this assumption out. We do not have neighborhood schools in Amherst. 
They are more like regional schools and serve large geographic swaths of the town that include many neighborhoods. Very few students walk to school with the majority being transported in a bus or a car. What we do have are strong school communities of students, parents, and teachers, and that would not be diminished in a consolidated school building. Let's face it, these are social centers for our town. We've all made many friends at our schools. The myth of the large school. A consolidated school building not, need not feel large. A talented architect could design a building that would feel significantly smaller than the current grade schools by splitting the new building into smaller, linear, two-story wings and including an entrance that was more in scale with grade school students. This is something that Dr. Morris has been talking about. Let's do a child-friendly building, not one that looks like a reject from some kind of corporate office park. Um, for River, and, and, you know, as a designer, I would, you know, I know it was designed for the quad system, but as a designer, if I was the professor uh, teaching those architects, they would get a D minus on the design of Fort River and Wildwood. Um, Fort River and Wildwood currently have sprawling floor plates on one level and were designed to house over, over 600 students each. They do not feel like small neighborhood schools to me. The myth of renovating the current schools. Fort River and Wildwood were designed for the quad system of teaching and feature large square spaces that were divided into four smaller discrete classrooms following the abandonment of the quad system, which worked well initially. I've talked to a teacher who worked in those for about 10 years and said when you got three teachers that worked well together, it worked well. Well, think about how often you have three people working together that well, right? This has not been successful because HVAC systems that have prevented solid floor to ceiling walls from being installed. This leads to sound bleed and distracting environment. Both schools were designed in the shape of a donut with minimal connection to the exterior environment. Why would you do that? <laughs> the current restrooms are located at the periphery of the building, further blocking windows and light. Another mistake. That, I, I, I'd start to lower the grade to an F at this point. The current rest, uh, uh, a new linear design would provide light and view to the outside world for each classroom. I don't want to see a brick wall outside any of these windows. I want to see green, that's what I want to see, and lots of light. Um, even with a renovation, the current layout of the schools would not achieve this goal and would require additions to meet current needs. To renovate these structures minimally to meet current building and life safety codes, they do not meet life safety codes for energy efficiency and they don't meet current energy efficiency codes. The, uh, Meeting these codes or renovating it to that level would not solve the configuration issues and would be costly. Solving the configuration issues would require gutting the buildings down to the walls and removing the slab, which has no subfloor insulation. Um, if we submit a proposal to MSBA to renovate one school, it could take up to five or six years until the building would be ready for use. What about the other school, right? If all went well, that might not be ready for use for 10 or 11 years. Can we afford to wait? And basically, it's not about the buildings. It really isn't. It's about, our, I believe, our most valued asset in this community are the students and the teachers. Let's face it, nothing's as valuable as, as those two bodies. They're both equally important to our town, and that's it. Thank you for your comment. Good evening. I'm Jan Klausner Wise, an uh, Amherst resident, but I would like to read a statement from Megan Carroll, a special education teacher at Fort River who could not be here tonight. I'm writing to express my concerns about the current state of the Fort River Elementary School building. As a special education teacher, these concerns are beyond what others might have. Quads without walls make students have a difficult time focusing on what is expected of them in a classroom setting. Students with autism spectrum disorders and attentional, attentional difficulties have an even more challenging task as they often cannot distinguish what things they should be paying attention to and what things they should ignore. After a recent snowstorm, I was helping students transition from one classroom to another in the hallway. We had to move around multiple trash barrels because of a leak in the ceiling. There were other classes in the hallway which created a distraction for my students. There were trash cans in both major hallways to the left and right of the library, preventing a clear path for us to walk. On another occasion, one of my paraprofessionals had to leave her student to get a custodian when the ceiling in the classroom they were working in started to leak. 
Working with students who have complex profiles makes having a safe space that much more important. The quads make it extremely difficult to contain students who may try to leave and navigating hallways with trash cans adds stress for everyone. Multiple students and staff consistently complain about the smell of mold in my classroom and in the building. Two students are particularly distracted by the smell and report it as a distraction to their work. At least three paraprofessionals and myself have allergies to mold and consistently experience headaches when at school but not at home. The heater in my room rarely blows warm air. When it does, by 10 a.m., the air is cold. Everyone expresses frustration over the temperature. My students experience sensory issues that make dif school difficult. The quality of the building they come to school in should not further escalate these issues. Um, thank you, Meg and Carol, and thank you. Thank you. Claire Bertrand, 610 Bay Road. I'm going to read from uh, a woman, Lonnie Leckman, who could not be here. Lanny is the Fort River librarian. She writes, I strive to make the Fort River Elementary School Library a place where all of our students, staff, and community members feel welcome to explore their interest and passion and to find and nurture a lifelong love for reading. Each student spends 40 minutes with their class in the library every week. But unlike the art room, which we heard about earlier, um, this room is not quite as welcoming. The library has a steady flow of people and students every day, and she tries to teach and maintain in the library space with the resources, mostly books. But the library itself is making it difficult. The outdated HVAC system makes it necessary to constantly run fans in order to circulate air so the books stay readable. So for much of the year, it means the library is cold. And even though we can't see outside because we have no windows, we know when it rains, there's leaks in the roof. There's a consistent leak that pools water in a light fixture before it gathers in a strategically placed trash can. We've heard that before. Last year, we had to move classes out of the library one day because the leaks covered 20 foot area, and it was too slippery for classes of students to access books. She writes more about it. Um, on sunny days, the lack of walls means that, unfortunately, normal hallway noise causes disruption and distraction in the library. So as a librarian and educator, I want our students to see their library as a safe place for kids and books but our current building doesn't support this. I hope our community can come together to start the MSBA process immediately. Lanny Blackman. Thank you. I'm going to ask that, if at all possible, when a point's been made, you kind of just move on to other points you might have to make. Be quick. Great, thank you. My name is Deb Leonard. I live at uh, 401 Old Farm Road. I have an elementary school student in fifth grade, my daughter, and two uh, who went through Fort River currently in the high school. Um, I volunteered in the library, and um, I'd like to share a short, uh, short story about that. We were in the library shelving books, Lanny, Engage, and I, and there was a lockdown or a shelter in place. I can't get the two straight. And here we are in the middle of the room with no barriers, <laughs> hallways all around us. We all kind of looked at each other and I thought, what do we do? There's no protection, there's no doors, there's no windows, there's nothing. Um, so in the many and varied ways that I've participated in the Fort River Elementary School since my son started in 2006, there have been so many instances where I like, I think, what do you do? When the ceiling leaks, when we had a leak at home, we had a, um, a pipe burst. These guys came in with fans and they stuck holes in the ceiling and they blew air through the ceiling so that the wet material dried out. We don't do that. We can't do that. It's just time. It's just time.
time to say goodbye to the 70s and the open floor plan. It's just time to say goodbye to putting Band-Aids and money, throwing good money after bad. It's, it's just time to move on. It's time to give our educators a, a building that supports their efforts instead of thwarts them. It's time to tell their, the kids that we're going to fix this problem. We, the adults in the room, are going to fix this problem and we're not going to wait because there's no reason to wait. It's just time to do it. It's time to come together. It's time to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ginny Hamilton. I live at 140 Middle Street, and I'm a current Crocker Farm parent. But tonight, I'm speaking in my role as co-chair of Amherst Forward. It's no secret that those active in our network were strong supporters of the previous schools project. And because of this, some people have questioned whether we support the current compromise proposal. And a few have even suggested we might derail the future process. So I'm here tonight to publicly state that Amherst Ford supports the proposal for one building, a one building solution to address the needs of both, for, both Fort River and Wildwood. We support the compromise that this school will serve approximately 600 students in grades K, K through five or K through six without the grade reconfiguration. Yes, we are disappointed to lose the expanded pre-K program offered by the previous project, and we favored grade reconfiguration in the past project because doing so would have eliminated the current practice of busing kids based on socioeconomic status and special needs. However, we do fully support this compromise proposal because it's the best path forward to get all kids, teachers, and staff into classrooms with windows and walls. Amherst has excellent educators who tell us these buildings are barriers to learning. And so we urge the council to please unanimously support this SOI. This compromise proposal is fiscally responsible and it's urgently necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Sheldon and I support this consensus proposal to get all of our students into school with windows and walls as soon as possible. I am a parent of a kindergartner and a second grader at the Fort River School. My eldest is enrolled in an intensive special education program at Fort River where she can get the programming, teacher, and peer support she needs to grow as a learner who is on the autism spectrum. I am so grateful for the Amherst schools that have made it possible for our daughter to remain a part of our Amherst community. This signals a level of acceptance that families with children with special needs are often denied as being able to attend a community school is not an option for most students who have, a challenge, who have as challenging a learning profile as my daughter's. In Amherst, two of our three intensive special needs programs are located at Fort River. The third is at Wildwood. The students served by these programs come from all three of the district's geographic enrollment zones. Our programs are rich and meaningful because we have a critical mass of students with like needs. Students form peer relationships. Special education teachers become experts. The program's pool of paraeducator staff share responsibilities, information, and can tag out when needed. We simply do not have enough students in our district with like needs to duplicate each of these programs with all their richness and resources at three schools. While out of enrollment zone placements mean we can provide outstanding program, it also presents challenges. My daughter is fortunate that the program she needs is located in the school for which she is zoned. However, two-thirds of the students in our intensive special education programs do not attend school with their neighbors and siblings. This creates barriers to entering and leaving these programs. It makes full integration into both the student's school community and home community challenging. It puts a unique burden on special needs families to juggle social relationships when siblings will never have the same teachers, principals, and school family relationships. At Fort River, my children's peers have the opportunity to see how teachers respond with kindness and calmness when my autistic daughter is having a rough time and is behaving in unexpected ways. The Fort River children practice doing the same in an environment where they know they are safe and supported. It is one thing for our community to teach inclusion in the theoretical. It is altogether more powerful to have the opportunity to truly learn it by practicing it. Both of my girls will emerge from Fort River with an understanding and working skills of how to be part of an inclusive community. I support this proposal that may move us from our existing three enrollment zones to two because it, op 
it offers opportunity for more of our students enrolled in our intensive special education programs to be fully welcomed into our community while, remain, while maintaining the level of programming they need to be successful learners. I also support the proposal because it means that more of our students will have the opportunity to learn side by side with all kinds of learners. I support this plan because it makes things better in so many deeply meaningful ways than they are now and is achievable within the near future. I am unwilling to wait for a theoretically perfect plan that will come too late for hundreds of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. My name is Stephen Merriman. I live at 56 Mount Holyoke Drive. And I'm here to read a statement um, by Nancy Stewart, who's president of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Prior to that, though, just as an aside, I would like to say that I'm the father of a seven-year-old child with special needs who's in, kinder, uh, who's in first grade at Fort River. And I just want to acknowledge that it amazes me how much care, devotion, and education transpires in that building given the fact that that facility itself currently functions on life support. Here now is uh, Nancy Stewart's comments on behalf of CPAC. CPAC supports this compromise uh, proposal to address as soon as possible the significant infrastructure deficiencies at both Fort River and Wildwood schools. The Special Education Parent Advisory Council, otherwise known as CPAC, is a volunteer organization of parents and guardians of children who receive any type of special education services or accommodations in school, such as the IEP, the Ed Individualized Educational Program, a 504C accommodation, or an out-of-district placement. These students make up approximately 20% of our school, popula school population, one in five. The noise and distraction caused by the open classroom design at Wildwood and Fort River profoundly affects all students, but this is especially true for students with autism, ADHD, children with trauma histories, and there are no shortage of those, and children with hearing impairments. This often results in children with disabilities spending significantly less time with their general education peers that they, than they might otherwise. CPAC will continue to work with our administration to ensure that the new elementary school that emerges from our collaborative work as a community will meet the needs of all our students. We believe that this can be accomplished under the framework proposed. Sincerely, Nancy Stewart, President, on behalf of CPAC. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Soloway. Um, I live in Amherst. I'm here to urge a unanimous vote in support of the SOI. I have two girls who attend Fort River, who love their Fort River community, and hate their Fort River building for all of the reasons that you've heard everybody else here say. But I wanted to speak specifically about um, how the building affects both of my daughters in different ways. And if it affects them, it must affect other children too. Um, my high achieving, relatively well adjusted nine year old is anxious every time it rains or if there's a thaw in winter. She begs to stay home. So when you look at the weather report and see a thaw coming in, in spring, you might be happy to see the end of freezing temperatures, whereas my nine-year-old, her classmates, her teachers, and especially the custodians at Fort River see something very different. Her sister, my seven-year-old, ha who has a learning disability, is unfortunate enough to receive her special education reading services in room D1 of Fort River. All of you should be familiar with room D1 at Fort River. It's the room where the video that has been going around with the just pouring rain in the corner of the building. And what I, why I am here today is to explain to you that that's not some back room. That's not some room where kids don't go. That is the room where my daughter and her two little best friends are pulled out of their regular classroom and taken to to, re to receive their reading special education services. So every day they're taken there to fulfill their IEPs because of their various learning disabilities. And that is the, the classroom that they are in. There's no way that those three little girls can fully concentrate with that happening in the corner. None of us would be able to. And 
so these little seven-year-olds certainly can't. My girls will grow up and leave Fort River in the next four years, but what's truly disturbing to me is that their amazing special ed teachers are still gonna be in that building, trying to do this with other generations of kids. So I'm just here to ask you to please give it an end and make it stop and vote unanimously for this SOI. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bennett Hazlip. Also, Ms. Griezmann, I'd like you to note that I have crossed out all the sections that, have, that would be repeating previous Thank comments. You. <laughs> <laughs> Lived here for 10 years and I have two children at Fort River. When town meeting voted down the last elementary school building project, there was a lot of talk of finding a compromise solution. This, what Mike has proposed, is that compromise. But I pers this is the part, I skipped all the good stuff. But I personally don't think that the MSBA will give Amherst's proposal the nod without the unanimous, unanimous support of the town council. I think that would send a clear, strong message that we can all be proud of. Thank you for considering it. Thank you. Alex Lefebvre, uh, 52 North Prospect. Um, I'm a volunteer at Crocker Farm. My son went to Crocker Farm. My husband's a teacher at Crocker Farm. And both of my in-laws are retired educators who also volunteer at Crocker Farm. Um, I, I guess just the thought that I want to leave you with is I think the need is clear. Um, I think what gets easy to get lost in is the perfect solutions. And people talk about what's best for our children and can't we do better and shouldn't we be thinking about ideal solutions. And unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. We don't live in a homogenous community anymore. We don't have kids that all learn the same. Amherst has this wonderful reputation for dealing with, working with kids with special needs, and they actually come to our schools. So we have a, a large uh, group of students who come to our schools because it's such a great community that works with kids with special needs. So we can't afford to continue to have our kids in these schools anymore. Is there a perfect solution? Possibly doubtful? Is it, t is it the same today as it will be tomorrow? So I urge you not to get caught in that message of there's a better way than what's in front of you today. And I urge you to trust the people that one, are elected, that two, have been hired, and three, who have sent their whole life in education and really are trying to do what's in the best interest of our kids. Thanks. Is there anyone else who has not spoken? Thank you. Okay, are there other comments from the council at this point? Questions, comments? Yes, Andy. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody who spoke here today. I thought about saying something um, earlier when the council was speaking and decided that it was important that uh, as somebody who's elected to the council that I hear from you. So I really appreciate that. I just have three really quick things that I want to, just want to share. One is that um, I was a Fort River parent a long time ago. My kids were there uh, as students in the 1980s. And uh, I, it was a fairly new building back then, but it had all, a lot of the same problems that exist today. And I felt then that my children got a great education despite the building, not because of the building. And uh, as, as I look at what has happened to the building, it has deteriorated over time, uh, which is why uh, that is true. The second thing is uh, uh, to the superintendent, the statement of interest, the one thing that I was sort of curious about was why it did not mention a little bit more about some of the environmental aspects of the building. Um, the Fort River building, and actually both buildings are built on cement slabs. Nobody would construct a building that way now, not a school building, certainly. And uh, it is, as we found out from the Fort River feasibility study, only worse because it's very wet property and it is uh, close, Ford River is close to a river, 
and uh, which is how it has its name. Uh, so so uh, I, I think that it would be, um, it's an important point that we need to remember as a community and if we can remind MSBA of it, that that would be helpful. And the final thing is, as chair of the council's finance committee, um, we have, uh, we submitted our report for um, the last two finance committee meetings and we touch on the subject quite strongly. It's mostly about, as a matter of fact, uh, the feasibility of going forward with um, the number of different major capital projects that are there. And one aspect of it is the um, work that we did with um, the help of the professionals who work with us to study the costs of the various school options so that we could understand that is how it fit in. And uh, there's no question that the options with a 600 student single school are the um, most cost responsible way to address the multitude of projects that we're having to consider as a council. And that is uh, the, uh, a major substance of the report, which is available to the public through the website. And so thank you. Are there other comments from the council? Dorothy. I want to thank everybody for filling in all the details. And yes, it was a good idea to have us go to a listening session uh, next to a very uh, active open classroom. And I want to say that I am dedicated that the new school building that we build be built well, be well designed, and that we don't, it is the most uh, responsible fiscal thing that has been presented, but that we make sure that it is done well. Because at the beginning, I didn't understand what the problem was. I taught in an open classroom for three years, uh, the Louis Armstrong Middle School in the 1980s in East Elmhurst, Queens. I never had any of these problems. And it sounds like this school was flawed. The two schools were flawed from day one. So I just want you to know that there, there will be a new school building and it will be well built. Thank you. Additional comments from the council? We want to thank all of you. This has been a very informative evening. Uh, and with audience comments that have reinforced much of what the superintendent has told us, uh, and we've heard it directly from you. We are going to take a break at this point and reconvene at 8.30. Thank you. It's amazing. The uh, big brothers, big sisters, representatives come forward to the seats. Good on. evening. Hold on, hold on. Just getting us queued up. <laughs> okay, we're going to reconvene, and um, this item is actually a request for um, permission with regard to a public way. And please proceed, identify yourself, and let's go move forward. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jesse Cooley. I'm the director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. Thank you for letting me speak now. I appreciate that. Um, and so I'm here to request the road closure that we need for our daffodil run. Um, and we've done this in years past. Some of you may recall, hopefully you've been there. It's the, this is our ninth annual daffodil run, which is a 5K run and walk and a 10K run to benefit Big Brothers Big Sisters. And the event takes place in Kendrick Park. It's Sunday, April 28th, always the last Sunday in April. So we um, uh, need the road that is right next to Kendrick Park, Old North Pleasant. We're requesting for that to be closed for the duration of the event, which um, we're, we're requesting the closure from 8 a.m. to 12 noon on that Sunday. And a small portion of uh, North Pleasant, basically from the corner of East Pleasant and North Pleasant up to Main Street, 
closed just for 15 minutes from 10 a.m. to 10.15 a.m. I do have a map if that's helpful that I could pass out, but I didn't bring an electronic version. We were all provided with the map in our packet. Wonderful. Thank you. So this is uh, no different than what we've done in any years past, but if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I did meet with um, Captain Ting, who has taken over for Captain Gunderson on the police department. We drove the course and talked about the plans for the officers that we'll need and all of that, so I'm happy to answer questions along those lines. Okay, are there any questions of the council? Mandy Jo. Um, so I have a couple of questions. You talked about some road closures, but we also were provided with some metered parking reservations. Um, so I'm assuming that's part of your request. Yes, it is. Um, so I have a couple of questions. <laughs> the, and this will be just confirmation from the town manager, I believe. The road closures, the any police will be, are, is charged to or is paid for by Big Brothers, Big Sisters. The metered parking is not um, and I guess I have a question about the road closures, at least the 9 or 8 a.m. to noon road closure, the North Present Street one. Are people still allowed to park in the meters that aren't part of the reserved meter parking? Because aren't there more than just those seven? Uh, yes, there are, and they can park in those. Uh, but basically, not many people park on that street at night. Uh, overnight anyway it's a not a very utilized parking area were you did you have additional questions okay are there other questions from the council uh, okay then the motion reads and so I'm going to place this in motion in the interest of time to approve the closure of that section of North Pleasant Street beginning at the intersection of Halleck Street and moving north to the intersection of Triangle Street from 8 o'clock a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. and North Pleasant Street from East Pleasant Street to Main Street from 10 a.m. to 10.15 p.m. on Sunday, April 28, 2019 for the CHD Big Brothers Big Sisters annual daffodil run and further to approve the reservation of the seven metered parking spaces on North Pleasant Street along the southwest side of Kendrick Place from 8 a.m. to 12 noon on April 28, 2019. Is there a second? second. Pat D'Angelo seconded. Any further questions? Yes, this does have to be roll call. Okay. Councillor Balmill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Grismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? No. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. You have 11 to 1? No, it must be 10 to 1. I'm sorry. There's one person absent. I'm sorry, 10, 10 to 1. Person. No, no, no. I'm sorry. It's 11, 4, and 1 opposed. And one absent. Okay. Any further questions on that? Okay. Then we're going to return to item 5B. And thank, thank you very, you much. very much. So if item, if item 5B is the East Street School Affordable Housing. John Hornick, please come forward. And let me just mention that this portion of the agenda uh, will begin with the presentation, have the opportunity for the council to ask questions, then we will open it up for public comment. I am John Hornick. Name's properly spelled there, but not on your agenda. I'm sorry <clears throat> about that. <laughs> I am chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and as you can see, I have a presentation. 
even though it's five acts, it won't take very long. Uh, Nate is going to distribute copies of the presentation. I urge you not to look ahead because there are spoilers. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Whoops. I have no idea which, how I move this along. He needs technology help. <laughs> Sorry. That one. Okay. So created, creating affordable housing at the East Street School site, a play in five acts. And I start out, as you should with a play, listing the dramatis personae. Um, Basically, if any of you have ever renovated a house or built a house or other building, at least half of those actors will be familiar to you. Um, and they're roughly in the order in which they appear in the play. So I, I think I'll just move that right along. And uh, before I introduce Act One, I want to introduce our actors for Act One entering stage left. There is myself, who is kind of the face of the Housing Trust. <clears throat> but beyond that, it's important to know that we have a very solid, smart, experienced membership. The next person I listed was Tom Kegelman, who in his day job is head of home city development. That's a not-for-profit corporation with headquarters in Springfield that does a lot of affordable housing in the Valley and has for a long time. That's a substantial part of Tom's career. Next, I listed Nancy Schroeder. <clears throat> Nancy is currently a member of the Amherst Housing Authority Board, and before that, for many years, she was their director of operations. Doug Slaughter was part of our group from the select board. Uh, Greg Stutzman is included. Obviously, he served for a number of years on the planning board, very involved in zoning issues, as well as local real estate. Sid Ferreira um, is at the University of Massachusetts. He's in charge or director of residential acad academic programs. And some of you may also know he and his wife direct the ABC house. Um, finally, we have Jay Levy who, when I met him 30 years ago, in the eastern part of the state, was involved in homeless services. He still is. So it's a long career, and he's in charge of Elliott Community Services in western Massachusetts, which is a principal provider of uh, case management and clinical services to persons who are homeless in this area. Uh, finally, Nate Malloy, who's at my left, who is a senior planner and brought a wealth of experience to all of our work. And last, but really not least, because she's really the heart of the work we've done, is Rita Farrell, a consultant to the trust, who had a 25 or 30 year career with the Mass Housing Partnership, working with local communities on the development of affordable housing, and actually included Amherst. I hate to interrupt the play, but uh, we have lost Alyssa Brewer, who was here um, on a remote participation as a member of the council. And we need to note that in the, she's back on. We're, so we're just gonna make some okay. noise. Yeah. Okay. Yes. She's back on, excellent. Great, great Alyssa, proceed. I wouldn't wanna miss Great it. work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, act one, a feasible project. Uh, we've taken a number of steps as the housing trust that I just wanted to briefly outline. Um, we moved control of the property from the schools to the town with the collaboration of town meeting and the town manager's office. We did an, ass we, still okay? we, we did an assessment of wetlands, which was disappointing. Um, for people who are familiar with the property, there's a back lot that we hope would be available. It's not. It's all wetlands. It's been used as an informal recreation area, but the front of the lot is available. We had a site survey, and as many people probably know, we hired Hewn Riddle architects to try to understand what is possible for the site development. Um, and they've done, I think, three public 
presentations, including one at a major housing forum that we had last November. Finally, our last step was to draft a request for proposals, which spells out the qualifications of the developer, both minimum requirements and higher program expectations for which bidders will receive more point for the development of affordable housing at the site, and finally, a process for selection of the developer. So, Act Two. Having demonstrated that we have a feasible project through the steps that I just outlined, we are now seeking permission from the town council to proceed. So enter town council, center stage. Uh, the steps that I understand, um, we are looking for you to take our first, <clears throat> to declare the East Street School site as surplus property. Second, to authorize the town manager to execute a land disposition agreement. It's a special form of contract and it will spell out the conditions under which the developer will qualify for the next stage, which um, is uh, the authorization for the town manager to sign a 99 year lease. Uh, Alyssa asked me at one point, why now? What are the pros? What are the cons? Um, for me, the main pros is this is going to be a long process. If you act on April 1st to approve this, it'll probably be two to three years before the first renter walks in the door. Uh, and the second thing I'll note is if you pass this on April 1st, then you're in a position to move on to the huge backlog of other business that you've created. What are the cons? Maybe someone else will come up with a better idea in the next five years. That hasn't happened in the last five years, but some of you may be quite optimistic about the future. The most important implication of town council action is that it will give the developer site control. Under the land disposition agreement, um, the developer will have a legal commitment from the town to turn over the property. Uh, if they don't have that, they're really not able to go to lenders to ask for money. They'll turn a deaf ear. They can't go to the zoning board to ask for a special permit. They can't do any of the actions that are really required for them to move forward. So if they don't have that, no one will bid. Okay, we're already on to Act 3. Now the stage manager and his staff come in and their tasks are releasing the RFP, getting bids, selecting a developer, signing the legal agreements including the land disposition agreement and eventually a 99 year lease and finally <clears throat> monitoring fulfillment of the uh, contractual requirements. This is the town manager's role as I understand the charter. Okay, act four. Enter the developer, now center stage. The developer will have to undertake due diligence, diligence process, which means that they'll go over back over some of the steps and go over new steps to, for example, evaluate the old East Street School building. Is that something they'll be able to make use of or not? Kuhn Riddle provided a path, but they couldn't tell us, for example, how much lead or asbestos they would be, uh, have to deal with in the building. And if that turns out to be very substantial, then the developer probably cannot reuse that building. The developer will then come up with a plan for the site. At that point, they will probably have an architect, almost certainly. And then, given that we've given them site control, they will go through the various town approval process, funding processes, and possibly the historical commission, both state and local. That would need to happen if they do not want to use the old school building or they want to seriously change the exterior in some way. Uh, 
Finally, the developer gets to execute that 99-year lease with the town and actually do the construction of affordable housing. Now, this next slide after Act 4 isn't an act, but this goes along with Act 4. What I want to do is reassure all of you that you are not the last review, that, no, that only you are responsible for making sure that this thing works. In fact, there are many reviews. I could sit, well, I won't rate them, but I put Department of Housing and Community Renewal first because they have more requirements than the length of my arm or maybe two arms. If you go up on their website, you can see very lengthy requirements and restrictions in order to apply for a funding agreement from that agency. And they are likely to be the major funder or the major source of funds for the development. They have to go to the Amherst Zoning Board, likely to get a special permit because the site will not be easy to use <clears throat> and will not fit easily into uh, a by right development. Likely they have to go to the Amherst Historical Commission, maybe the State Commission if they go to the local one. They have to go before the Amherst Building Commissioner. Actually, that happens multiple times. As you all may know, there are electrical inspections, plumbing inspections, other inspections. So there are a lot of things that have to happen before the Building Commissioner signs off. And finally, the fire department gets involved as well, checking out smoke detectors, fire safety, and, and all of that. So as I said, there are many reviews. You are not the last review. You are the first review. God help the developer with all of that. So last, Act 5, Welcome Tenants. Um, it's likely the developer will choose a management company to continue to manage the property. Um, that company would ordinarily be included in their description in response to the bid for proposals. So that means the town gets to approve that choice. Um, then they select eligible tenants. They can't take anybody that they want. They have to follow the rules of the Department of Housing and Community Development to assure eligibility for affordable housing. Um, then they rent units. Uh, they maintain the property. And everyone lived happily ever after, but only if we get beyond Act Two. Thank you. Oh, thank you. What a play. <laughs> Thank you for, first of all, walking us through the process. Since this is the first time this group, although a few members of the group have gone through this before, but it's the first time this particular group has gone through a process like this. Um, and also for adding just a little bit of humor at this hour of the evening. Um, are there questions from the council? Shalini. This is a question for the town, con uh, town manager. Uh, and I think this is something we were discussing earlier, that if this property goes to developers, then do they, does it become eligible for property tax? Would that bring property taxes to? It depends what, what, the developer, who, what developer owns it. So in terms of um, if it's a nonprofit, I don't think they pay property taxes. But if it's a for-profit developer, they would pay taxes. So if it's a nonprofit whose mm, who's main, uh, I mean, generally nonprofits, if it's not their main source of revenue and main work, then it's still taxable and um, or something like that. There are various nonprofit developers um, who develop particularly affordable housing, and so if it's a nonprofit developer, uh, then they don't pay taxes. As it was explained to me, this is a use that is separated in the law. So it's, they're not gonna, it's not a nonprofit that's a religious institution. Mm -hmm. It's not a nonprofit that's uh, an educational institution. They're essentially in a business and they're renting these places mm -hmm. out to people. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is a taxable activity. 
Okay. Pat. I just actually wanted to ask Tom back there. You were saying that was incorrect, and John clarified some of it, but can you yes. go further? Tom Kegelman, resident of Amherst, and executive director of Home City Housing. We're a nonprofit. We do a lot of affordable housing. And uh, louder. Tom Kegelman, executive director of Home City Development. We do a lot of affordable housing development. We're a nonprofit. And um, I have I never have had a project that we didn't pay taxes, sorry. property taxes. Um, I'm sorry, please repeat that sentence. We have never had a project where we did not pay property taxes. Okay. It's, um, if, if our office where we serve people, that can be tax exempt, but providing residential housing for people, that's a business, it is, I, I don't know anywhere where you can get a tax exemption for that. Thank you for that clarification, Tom. Sorry, Nate Malloy, I just want to jump in. You know, affordable units are taxed, uh, you know, it's a prorated amount. So, you know, because it's affordable, the way the assessor calculates the tax, it's a prorated amount. So it's different than if it were, um, you know, market rate, but it is still taxed. Mandy Jo. I've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to stay on this one. My understanding is the town would still own the land. So why is there any property tax being taxed? Because it says here that there's it's for a 99-year lease. So isn't the town still keeping ownership of the land and leasing it out? And if the town owns the land, are there any ability to collect property taxes at all? It's my understanding that if it's a rental, that the, we, you would collect the taxes based on the rental income, and that's typically how the assessors would appraise that property, based on the rental market. Can I ask but, to clarify? So we have a couple of other pieces of land that, have, that are rented out to other entities right now. Do they pay property taxes on that they land? They do. They do. You know, for Olympia Oaks, for instance, was developed as affordable housing, and they they have to pay taxes. But do we own the land underneath Olympia Oaks? Yes, we entered okay. into a ground lease with. Olympia. I'm sorry, Dorothy. Um, in Act, the bottom of the page on Act Two, implications of town council actions. You say the developer has a legal commitment from the town to turn over the property once contractual conditions are met. And I'm not sure what that phrase, to turn over, means. I mean to uh, do the lease, the 99-year lease. Oh, okay. It's a technical term. Yes, Pat. Um, you talked about the, the damn it. Um, sorry. <laughs> you talked about uh, diversity uh, of, around affordability. And I'm wondering what other kinds of diversity ca uh, can you assure us? Will this be uh, available to people of color, uh, to disabled people? How will we expand our idea of diversity beyond income? Um, as I said, the eligibility for tenancy will be based on rules set down by the major, likely major funder, Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, I can't tell you that they're going to select so many persons of color, uh, Councillor DeAngelis, uh, but there's no question in my mind that uh, these units will be available to rent for persons of color. Yeah, I did, Nate Malloy, I just want to say the, you know, the marketing um, agent for the property has to you know, comply with fair housing regulations. and so. They base their marketing on what the demographics are of Amherst, and we're in the Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area. So there's a pretty big area where they develop their marketing. And then um, typically for affordable housing projects, you can have up to a 70% local preference, so you can try to get local residents. But you know, they, they market the units, and then they might have a lottery in terms of how many people apply. So it is a pretty broad um, area that they market to. So there's a good chance you know, you'll get a good representation of people. 
Thank you. Yes, Doris, you. Uh, I just have a question for the town manager on his memo uh, to John uh, giving bullet points with regard to the RFP. Um, and one of the bullets, I think there's a typo in it, but uh, I think it means to say to the extent practical maybe, it says to the extent practice, development to incorporate green building technology and solar renewable resources. And um, just wondering if it could say something more like to the extent possible. Um, that's one thing. And also, I just want to know, you know, if I think that there's probably a niche for affordable housing developers and whether we know that we can find developers that are both for affordable housing and um, green, using green technology and so. The Department know. of Housing and Community Development has been pushing the people, developers that it funds, to move in the direction of greater energy efficiency, green technology. And remember I said that if you go to their website, you look at their requirements for uh, developers. They include statements about energy efficiency, green technology, and we have incorporated those or at least reference those in the RFP. So yes, we are committed to it, and uh, there are, and, and so if you looked at the RFP, that's who you would find. I, I hope you'll consider changing from to the extent practical to to the extent possible. Again, we, we use DHCD language, the language that I used in the memo may not fully represent exactly what the developers will be required to do by DHCD. It may be much more or more consistent with what you're asking for. Okay. Amanda Joe. Um, I have two questions. They might not all go to you, John, but thank you. Um, the first one is when you're reading what town meeting voted and and all of the memos talked about the town meeting vote and what the town council's role in this was the town council's role under that vote was um to vote after um a determining that a feasible project has been identified and there were legal opinions and all about that but i seen and then there was a legal opinion that said for understandable reasons there's a request to sort of change that vote but i see nowhere here an actual motion to change that legal requirement that was passed under town meeting don't we if we are going to do this prior to determining whether there's a feasible project that has been identified don't we need to formally amend the town meeting action somehow? So that's more of a process question because there's been no sort of in all of your what votes we need to take, none of these actual, hey, we're going to amend and acknowledge that we're amending something that town council actually told us we should be doing and we're going to do it differently. So I'm concerned about sort of skipping that process and sort of glossing over the fact that we're changing what town meeting authorized us and gave us the authority to do. But my next question goes to sort of this whole process in general and planning in general. And it's more for, I guess, the council and for discussion potentially last next week or next meeting. We're being requested to make to take an action without reference to a finance committee despite there potentially being fiscal ramifications to this action. We're being asked to take an action without reference to any other committee that might deal with policy. We're being asked to take an action prior to what in two years the planning department has requested JCPC potentially fund in a 10-year capital plan for $70,000 of an East Village planning and zoning studies. Yet we don't have those studies. We don't have per the charter a capital improvement, in a capital inventory updated to give us all our inventory yet we're asking to be and to make a decision that it is surplus property 
and that is a major decision that affects the town for 100 years if the lease goes through. And I'm concerned that the potential process for making that decision is being, that we're being asked to shortcut that process on a number of levels. So um, I don't know, like I said, it might be better for that, but it would be great for maybe our town staff that are here to address potentially some of those concerns and maybe what hasn't, you know, what has been done already to look at whether this is surplus property and how that potentially was determined to recommend to the select board or ourselves because we haven't actually heard from town staff that they think this is surplus property. Let me ask Mr. Bachelman if he has a response at so, this point and then we'll come back. Yeah. So two answers. First to your first question, um, you are town meeting, so you can s supplant whatever a prior town meeting said. You are the legislative body, so we would get you the proper le legal language from our town attorney. Um, a prior town meeting doesn't direct what you do. You have independent authority to choose what you choose to do. You can put what any restrictions you'd like on the transfer or anything like that. Um, in terms of um, the... Um, whether this is surplus or not, we sort of work from the uh, action from the last town meeting, which has moved this in this moved this in this direction. Um, it really is up to the council as to how you want to take it in under advisement. If you want to have it go through a committee process, or if you want to wait until studies are completed, that's totally within the bounds of the council to make that decision. If you feel like this has already been vetted and that we're ready to go, you can choose to do that. It's totally how you want to handle this, whether you'd like it to go to the Finance Committee or uh, another committee that might be cre that is being created by the council or um, you want additional studies done by the town. Those are all things that you could request and we would comply with. Okay. Uh, Kathy, you had a question earlier and then I'll go over here. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I had a couple questions that I think uh, build on, I shouldn't say what might underlie some of Mandy's questions, so I'll just say, take it off. Um, do, do we have a sense of what this piece of land, should we sell it, would, would bring? You know, so what is, in essence, the gift, the commitment that we're making uh, to affordable housing in a dollar, so that's a question. And then my other, if the developer comes in and part of, so this would be a question I would have of any developer, not just for affordable units, but if part of the development requires us as a town to redo the roads, to do something different with sidewalks, so there's a public related cost to the development because of what they need for the site, could there be a way of asking the developer, since if we are giving them the gift of the land, to ask them to incorporate that into their costs of development? Um, so could that be done in the RFP? You know, uh, we, I know we don't have it in our zoning law that we can do an impact fee, but could we do it in the terms of the RFP? So and I, if anybody wants to add on to this, you can. Um, you can put whatever you want um, you own the land. If you say we're going to sell the land with these restrictions on it, meaning that we're going to have brick sidewalks in front, you can put that in. The developers will then incorporate that into their pro forma as an added cost that they would put forward into their project. You can put any restrictions you want in, as you move forward on this project, just so you can put any codicils on it, because you, can, you, you are the owners of the land in essence. You know, maybe I was doing, assume we still hold the land and we get a response to the RFP notifying them then that to the extent that's going to be needed, they should incorporate it. So it's, it's a twist on what you just mm -hmm. said, Paul. On, I think you're saying, yes, we could make that, we could write that into a, an RFP if we wanted to. Right. John. Yeah, I wanted to respond to that. Um, as I can't disagree with the town manager that you can do anything you want, but I wish you wouldn't. <laughs> and I'll put, explain it this way. The housing trust went through a lengthy process 
of determining what should and should not be in the request for proposal. We went back and forth on what the requirement should be and where we needed to give a potential developer flexibility, frankly, strongly influenced by Tom Kegelman's experience. And what we tried to determine is what the minimum requirements were, what we absolutely should expect, but then left room for the proposal or for the developer to propose something beyond that to get more points in the bidding process. So as an example, we said there have to be a minimum of 15 affordable units. Honestly, I'd like to see 30. Kuhn Riddle provided a path to actually more than 30 units. And it's not easy to find a site. It's a big deal. And so we didn't say you got to do 30 because we don't know what the developer is going to encounter in the process of planning for the site, in the process of seeking funding, in the process of dealing with the Zoning Board of Appeals, and all the other reviews that they have to undergo. So we thought it was important to leave flexibility. So if you add something, require something in addition, what you are doing is constraining the developer in a way that may make following through on this project either more difficult or potentially impossible. Thank you. Mr. Bachman, did you have anything further to add to that? Yes, Shalomi. I'm S Steve. Steve. <laughs> Hi. So um, in the answer, one answer to Councillor Shane's question is I'm looking at the property card, which is probably partly fiction, but it has the building value at $2.3 million and then the land value at $145,000. Yeah. Um, so a question, is the intent that this would be a comprehensive permit, like a friendly 40B, or is that not been determined yet? So, <coughs> this, uh, Nate here, I'll jump in. The, um, you know, the minimum was, was 15 units, and the zoning you know, requires so much additional lot area um, per additional unit, and so you know, the lot is pretty big with the backfield, so if you keep it one lot at 15 units, you may be able to do it as a special permit. It really depends on the developer and how they respond to the RFP, so if they would like to do more units and reduce parking and do certain things, then it could be a comprehensive permit, but um, as the minimum standards John described, you know, you could, it could be done without, you know, without a comprehensive permit. It really depends on how they respond with a site plan. Yes, Pat. While I'm uh, gaining uh, slowly, slowly uh, respect for process <laughs> uh, and process questions, I think there's a great need for affordable housing in Amherst, um, the making and creating of it so that it's available not just to current residents but to potential residents of Amherst. I think that this project has gone through uh, quite a bit of analysis and thoughtfulness and it's produced some really interesting, uh, the Kuhn Riddle study particularly has created some really interesting uh, possibilities. Um, and I think there's a basic urgency to getting the RFP out there. And so I, I would hesitate to send this to a committee to do the things that would slow it down um, because this is such an important and critical issue in, our, in Amherst. Dorothy. Um, I'm going to say something and then I'm going to ask you if I've said it correctly. Um, in going through the um, math on how you figure out what the rent would be for an affordable unit, I was really surprised to find out that it could be like $800. And to me, that's a lot of money. So if it's so expensive to live in the town of Amherst that $800 rent is considered affordable, then it would sound to me as if we've got a very big problem and that we really need affordable housing. Are my numbers correct? Well, I can't speak to $800 specifically because the rent will depend upon the number of persons in a family, for example, um, and what their income is. So the amount of rent they have to pay varies, as I said, with family size and, and income. Uh, I guess I don't want to get into the weeds here, but 
uh, if a unit is rented at, for a family at 30% AMI, it's going to be less than if it was rented to a family at 80% of area median income. I can provide more information to the council on that point, but basically, yes, somebody might be charged $800 a month, um, but uh, it could also be significantly less. So, I'm, John, I'm just going to clarify. So, you know, when I said that Amherst was part of the Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area, they take the uh, income for that area and they determine, you know, for a one bedroom, if it could be one or two people, they have the median income for, you know, at a certain percentage level, whether it's 30% or 50% of that median income. So, in a one bedroom, it could be one and two people. So, they take the average of that at 80% and they say no more than a third of your income can be paid, you know, paid for housing and that's what, how they determine the rent. So it's by bedroom size. So a one bedroom might be around 800, a two bedroom might be 1100, a three bedroom is 1300. And so, um, you know, in comparison, you know, a one bedroom market rate might be anywhere from um, 1500 to 1700 or, you know, depending on the range, how, how it's figured. So the rent for Amherst isn't necessarily um, you know, it's factored in to a bigger region, and you can have a lower percentage. So you could say, well, 80% is the maximum allowed income for affordable unit, but you can have reduced, you know, 50% AMI or more. That just means the developer has to come up with more subsidy to pay for that difference in, in rent level. Um, but it is, it, is, it, it, can, it is actually surprising how much it costs to live. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. You know, even an affordable unit to me is not affordable, you know, you think about, wow, it's not that affordable. Andy. So I guess I'm going to respond on a couple of things that have come up in this discussion. And one is about um, finance committee and looking at it. Finance committee can and should do as much as we can to inform the discussion. In the end, I think we will come to a conclusion that there is going to be costs and benefits and the benefit that we get from going forward is the creation of affordable housing that doesn't exist in the community and that needs to be valued. The other side is the uh, fact that we're trying to do a lot with our budget right now, particularly our capital budget. And probably as a matter of due diligence, the Finance Committee probably should take a look before we vote into what would be the reasonable value that we might have if we sold that piece of property on the open market, assuming that was a decision to be made. And um, then the council can at least weigh those two very um, significant pieces that I just mentioned. Uh, the other thing is that, um, going back to my former life uh, as a member of the select board, we did a lot of uh, work with the help of uh, assistant town manager Zomack in developing a surplus real property disposition policy. And this is really uh, part of that policy. Uh, it might be good um, for the education of the council to consider whether the council is interested in obtaining a copy of the policy and having um, Mr. Zomack, if that were possible, come before the council and explain um, how it was developed, what the thought process was, and uh, how this works, um, this piece of property fits within that policy, uh, just so that kind of bring you back to speed where a couple of us who are on the select board probably are a little bit more aware of that history. Andy, did you want to speak on the JCPC question? There was a question raised earlier as to whether or not JCPC we should review this. It, or Mandy Joe. It, it wasn't a question. It was just a statement that JCPC, the planning department, has put into the 10-year plan a zoning of $70,000 sort of placeholder for two years from now, two fiscal years from now, for planning and zoning of that village center. That I see. Okay, so thank you. It was an informational you. thing. Right. 
Got it. And specifically, however, Mandy Joe, you also raised the issue of a review by GOL, and that would be for what purpose? Uh, not GOL. I was actually thinking of the potential committee we might be creating tonight that would, oh, in general, okay. review that. Uh, um, it's just not created yet, so I didn't mention it. Community resources. Yes. Okay, thank you. I just want to clarify what you were referring to. Are there, uh, yes. I mean, Joe, go ahead. Sorry, this, this question actually goes to um, Mr. Harnick. Um, when I was reading the information you gave us, and thank you for so much of it, you had, <laughs> had a memo to the council, and you had an FAQ for the council, and they appeared to conflict in one, to me, very important issue. And so I'd like you to address it. And I'm going to read the two sections that I thought conflicted. In the FAQ, under how many units will be developed, the statement was the RFP specifies a minimum of, oh, Alyssa says there is no sound. So is it, it might be back. Um, At the minute show that. <coughs> she might be back. We'll see. We're pausing for a moment yeah. to see if she's back. She's back. It's okay. back, yep. Alyssa, so, you're there? She says it's back. Okay. Um, to go back, the FAQ in response to that request of how many units said the RFP specifies a minimum of 15 affordable units. And I won't read the rest of that, but it said 15 affordable. The memo that you wrote to us said at some point what the RFP included was, quote, a minimum of 15 rental units with 24 bedrooms for individuals and families with at least... 50% affordable at 60% AMI with a mix of bedroom sizes, and a minimum of 10% affordable to households earning 30% AMI. What I read that to mean was that they had to propose at least 15 units, but only eight of them had to be affordable. And so I'd like you to address what I read as a in some sense, a complete conflict of is it 15 affordable at a minimum or is it 15 units at a minimum with only half of them affordable? Easy to address. The RFP says a minimum of 15 affordable units. Uh, the frequently asked questions are ones that I would ask myself frequently in the middle of the night. Um, and so uh, we may have been a little sloppy in uh, writing that section. Uh, my apologies. Okay. Good clarification. Further questions at this time? All right, I, I'd like to step back before we go to audience comment and just say I do want the council to think about what additional information or additional actions you at least want to consider before we do any approval of this. We're not gonna do that tonight, okay, unless you'd like to at least refer to the Finance Committee or something like that. That's a much more simple action, but I wanna make sure that if we come forward for this in two weeks with a vote, that we have done whatever else we feel that we need to do in order to get to that vote, okay? Just consider that. I'd like to move to public comment. Sure. Yes. Just, I just, Mandy, I want to, Joe, I want to um, address your question about the vote that would be taken. So, um, I just, I just want to say that you're right. The town meeting vote is, you know, it's a legitimate vote that happened in 2018, and so the council would amend that vote. And as Paul said, you could put any language in. And so, what John was asking the council to do, right? It, um, to authorize the disposition of, or transfer of the, of the property, um, authorize the town manager to enter into legal agreements, all that can be done in one vote. You know, it could be separated out, but we would have some language that would be very clear what you're doing, but it can all be done in one vote. So, you know, it would say something like to, you know, amend the previous vote and to authorize these few things so it would be clear what's happening. It wouldn't be confusing. I, I think the 2018 town meeting vote was confusing. Usually the town council wouldn't look at the pro forma of a developer because a developer wouldn't respond to something knowing that they're not going to get site control until they've already spent, you know, many dollars into a process. So 
I think the vote was a little quirky, and so the next vote would try to be cleaner and, you know, and hopefully, you know, more understandable. That was one of the reasons why I was just suggesting that we carefully consider what we need to get to to vote on what, because um, none of us want to be caught in a situation where we didn't cleanly do our business. Okay. Uh, yes, Shalini. I was just curious, how long have you been working on this affordable housing project? Well, it depends on when you date it. Um, I believe that this idea was suggested back four or five years, um, possibly by Connie Kruger, possibly by others. The Housing Trust has been digging into this probably for about two years. Okay. Other questions from the council at this time? We just lost Alyssa again. No. We lost her again? No. Okay. All right. Other questions from the council at this time? You'll have op other opportunity, but um, may I see a show of hands of the people who would like to make public comment? All right. Alyssa, why don't you come forward? Elisa. Thank you. I'm Elisa Campbell. I am representing the League of Women Voters of Amherst tonight. The League is a nonpartisan political organization that seeks to help inform voters about elections, voting, and issues. As you know, we do not support political parties or candidates, but we do sponsor candidate forums. And I put that in because my recollection when I attended them was that just about everybody running for council said they thought this was a great place to have affordable housing, which made me very happy. At the state level, the League has a position adopted in 2008 that in summary states, the League supports programs, policies, and regulations to address the housing needs of low and moderate income families and individuals. Everyone should have access to decent and affordable housing in a suitable living environment. So that's the goal. We all know we're not meeting it. And this project is a step in the direction of beginning to meet it for at least some people. The timeline that John provided and which he referred to already illustrates that if this gets a positive vote from the council at the beginning of April of 2019, we might actually have construction start in two years. And as he said, some actual real people might be able to move into a real unit in three years. So we urge you to do your due diligence, but move this project along. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other public comment at this time? Okay, any other thoughts or questions or requests for additional information from the council? So I'm hearing that prior to two weeks from now, you do not want this considered by some committee. You do not want additional information. I would love to see the surplus real property disposition policy that, that my fellow counselor mentioned. Um, okay. And I, I would like us counselors to seriously consider at least FinCom at a minimum considering would you like this. to make that as a motion? Um, if we can make motions tonight, I will make that motion. You can make a motion to, de to refer. I, I will make a motion to refer this matter to the Finance Committee. Is there a second? For the purposes of discussion, I'm going to second it. Further conversation, yes. I would just like to amend that with a report back fast, you know, so that we still plan to take a vote on when we're planning on taking a vote, so it's not that we'll just 
let it languish in finance, um, whatever it is we're thinking we're supposed to be doing well, in, as a member of finance. And between now and the next meeting of the council, there are two finance yeah, committee meetings. Yeah, we have so. two, but there's, so there's no reason yeah. we can't meet that, but I just, you know, right. if we're going to be considering it, it's not to delay, right. it's to deal and, with whatever other issues. And Mandy Jo, is there specific things you want the finance committee to re consider? Um, yeah, I would like them to consider the sort of cost benefit of um, disposing of this property for affordable housing versus what other uses it could have and the costs or the benefit the town, you know, the, the financial gain the town might have from, say, selling it to a for-profit entity for some other use. Um, I, I would just also say I think it's important as we move forward as a council um, that we recognize that not everything needs done immediately and is outside of our typical process that we as a council we are now into our fourth month of operation almost finishing our fourth month of operation and we should be stopping saying well this one's an exception and this one's an exception because pretty soon if everything's an exception then that becomes the rule and if we're going to have a finance committee that's supposed to look at the financial implications of actions we should start referring things to the finance committee to look at the financial implications of actions if we're going to create a community resources committee later tonight that is supposed to look at planning and policy surrounding planning and village centers then we shouldn't be afraid to say maybe we should wait for two weeks till they can look at that and come back with pros and cons we can't I don't think we should keep saying this is an exception that's an exception I haven't heard any immediate deadlines presented tonight um, that require us to act by April 1st because we would lose certain funding. I don't necessarily think an extra two weeks or an extra four weeks, two more meetings, would delay a project another year um, for an RFP. And I think we need to start considering that as we move forward because that's what we should be doing. Okay, so the motion on the floor that's been made and seconded is to refer this to the Finance Committee. And the sense of the discussion is that they, that this has financial implications for the town and that you would like the Finance Committee to at least weigh the costs and benefits. Steve. I think one of the really difficult things about doing a full-on, say, real estate analysis like you're describing is that virtually every use is a special permit for this particular zone, as far as I understand. So the, I'm sorry, you'll have to speak um, into the mic. Pretty much every use is a special permit for this particular zone, except for schools, churches, or, or houses of worship. So, but everything else is special permit because special permit right. is discretionary. Then we really have no idea if that, you know, particular use would ever be permitted or not. So, I, I think it's a challenge to do that kind of analysis that uh, Councilor Haneke you know, is looking for. On the other mm -hmm. hand, I, there must be an appraisal of this property. There must be a what? An appraisal, I'm sorry, yeah. As you mentioned, there is a town appraisal, but that appraisal includes the back lot, yeah. which the town assessor may not have been aware is entirely wetlands. Yeah. So without digging into it, my sense is it's probably an overestimate of the value. I think it's gonna be awfully difficult in two weeks or frankly even in four weeks to assess the cost benefits of putting this stored affordable housing versus some unknown other use. Mm -hmm. um, it's like do you want to put affordable housing on the site or not I think and if you do then my recommendation is that you move forward. Other uh, yes Kathy. Oh. Or, well Shalini hasn't spoken yet so Shalini. Maybe take Shalini first. I was just going to actually say that I want to support what Kathy said, that l let the Finance Committee deliberate on this, but let it be done within the time. Because I do feel other committees and town meeting and a lot of due diligence has been done in the past, and they, propose, you know, they already forwarded it. And 
And I know there's a shortage of, we all know there's a shortage of affordable housing. And I also know how hard it is to get developers to commit to affordable housing. And we need to set the ball rolling. The more we can support and push this agenda, the more in the future we can attract more affordable housing developers and development. Okay. Andy, did you have a comment? Since you're chair of the finance committee? <laughs> I think that it depends upon the um, staff that's available to provide assistance to us in the timeline that we um, are looking to and uh, hopefully the appropriate staff will be available and that we can at least do some work. Um, I see my vice chair has. Okay, I thoughts. just, you know, the only, I was saying if we could move quickly, but given what was just described, I've been on tons of cost benefit. You can't do a cost benefit analysis right. of this. What Steve was saying, you just can't do it. I mean, it's a value statement that if we want to use right. the land in this way, right. um, we're putting a value on that. So I could put a very high price tag on the value of affordable housing and tell you it makes a lot of sense. So I don't think the review, if that's the question, it's not worth going to finance. I mean, we, the, the best we could do is get a land value with some caveats, but it wouldn't change the decision, do we want to locate the development here? These are, these are the times uh, um, when I take my scant economic background and say, and mathematical background, which is much stronger, and say, I think we mean a soft cost benefit analysis, not a, to a complete cost benefit analysis. Um, George. <laughs> I think the, the question really is, do we want um, affordable housing in Amherst, no matter what number comes back, no matter how big it is, no matter how small it is, um, the real issue that we need to think about, either tonight or perhaps at the next meeting, how important is it to us that we provide housing? Um, it's a critical need. Um, there are not that many sites. Um, this is a, a committee that's worked very hard to find a site. It's been prompted to do this by town meeting. Um, and uh, I think the issue really is, comes down to the question of affordable housing and uh, people may, need to make up their minds. Any other comments? So the motion on the floor is to refer this to the finance committee um, to review it as fast as possible uh, um, sometime between now and two weeks from now. Um, that motion's been made and seconded, not with all those little additional caveats. Is there any further discussion? Then I'm going to call the question and it's a roll call vote. Councillor Brewer? No. Councillor DeAngelis? No. Councillor Dumont? No. Councillor Griesmer? No. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? No. Councillor Ryan? No. Councillor Shane? No. Councillor Schreiber? No. Councillor Steinberg? No. Councillor Swartz? No. You have 11 to 1 with one absent. Oh, I'm sorry, Shalini. No. <laughs> Councillor Baumholm, I'm no. sorry. No. We have 11 to 1 with one absent. The motion fails. Um, I, I do think, however, there is a desire to see this uh, surplus real property disposition policy and the study that went along with that. Okay. Um, is there any other conversation or question at this time or other desired pieces of information? Okay. Then, yes. Dorothy? I just want to say encore. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time tonight, John. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, the timeline that was created indicated that back in, I think it was 2015 or 16, there was some study, an East Street School use study on the site and building with development constraints. 
does that study exist? It was like the second thing on the timeline, it's, and it's, it wasn't clear what it actually was. Whatever it is, if there is a report of that, can we get that too? Thank you. Are there any other requests for information? Alyssa, yes. Yes, if I can figure out the right button to push, thank you. Um, in regards to the motion that we know town council will have to draft for us for next time, could we please get that more than the Friday before the weekend so that we can plow through it? We saw the last one was rather complicated. Yes. Thank I have the, you. I have the feeling the town attorney will be working with us on that one. You couldn't see it, but Mr. Bachman shook his head. <laughs> Any further questions or requests? Then thank you for your presentation and for the hard work you've put to come forward to us. Thank you for your attention and support. Great. We're going to move on to action item 6B. Uh, yes. Would you mind using doing the proclamation for the no, league? No, not at all. Thank you for calling my attention to that. Uh, we're going to actually move on to 9A. 9A is a citation in celebration of the 80th year of the League of Women Voters in Amherst. Thank you. Um, I'm Janice Ratner, a member of the steering committee and chair of the 80th anniversary committee of the League of Women Voters of Amherst. The League first met on March 21st, 1939, 80 years ago this week. Since then, the League has had many candidates' nights, published many election guides and other publications such as Your Amherst Government and They Represent You, held many informational and educational meetings and forums, studied local government and many local issues and developed positions regarding them, and registered many voters. We hope to continue doing these things for many years to come. We thank you for considering a citation in honor of the 80th anniversary of the League of Women Voters of Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. And the citation is in your packet. Are there any questions? Comments? Then I call the question. Oh, Ed, I'm sorry, the motion. Thank you. I have to find my motion sheet in all of this. Don't worry. I have it. Okay. Uh, I uh, move to adopt the citation and celebration of the 80th year of the League of Women Voters in Amherst as presented. Pat DeAngelis made the second. Is there any further conversation? Question? All those in favor? We oh, we have to roll call. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Balmilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. We have 12 with one absent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations. All right. Our next, we are now, in fact, going to go to 6B on the agenda. It's the dissolution of the Energy and Climate Action Ad Hoc Committee. Let me just note that this comes because they have filed their final um, report and also, more importantly, their final set of minutes. Is there any discussion at this time? Okay, then I'd like to uh, place a motion to dissolve the Energy and Climate Action Committee ad hoc committee. That's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mandy Jo. Is the second? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Oops, roll call. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Grissomer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. 
Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. We have 12 with one absent. Okay. We're moving on to 6C, which is the charge for the Community Resources Committee. I will note at this time we are not approving, or I am not appointing people to this committee, but rather we are moving to the charge. Um, is there a motion to, well, council discussion first. The charge is in your packet. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, Mandy Jo. I, I just want to state that the GOL committee voted unanimously with one absent, I think, right, Steve? Um, to declare the charge clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. All right. Um, then I'd like to. I'd like to make the following motion to approve the charge of the Community Resource Committee as presented. Is there a second? Dorothy. I second it. Any further conversation? Then roll call vote. Councillor Grismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Ballmilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. We have 12. Okay. We're going on to 6D, which is the approval of the charge for the audit committee. Um, this was referred also to GOL. And Mandy Joe, do you have a comment? I just want to again mention that the GOL committee voted unanimously with one absent to declare this charge as presented uh, clear, consistent, and actionable. Any further questions or discussion? Then the motion is to approve the charge of the audit committee as presented. Is there a second? Second. Andy Steinberg is the second. Roll call vote. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Grissomer? Yes. We have 12. Okay. Uh, 6E was added to the agenda at the last minute, and the, me and the reason it is on the agenda is because the approval is something that, if we are going to approve it, has to be noted by March 29th. We, and we do not meet again. Um, the motion for this, and I'm going to just ask that Darcy speak to it. I wrote this out because it's a little complicated and I want to make sure you understand it. Um, the Sierra Club, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and their partners. Um, are encouraging municipal entities across Massachusetts to register to vote this year to strengthen the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, uh, which is the base energy code for new buildings and is adopted by Massachusetts and across the country. So what we would be voting for would be our actual building code. So um, regardless of whether Amherst registers to vote, this will affect code regulations in Amherst um, as the IECC standard is adopted, as I said, as the base energy code for math. Few municipalities exercise their votes, um, so it would be good to make sure that Amherst registers as an entity and gets to vote. 
Um, we need someone inside our municipal government to register the city as a member, um, as Lynn said, by March 29th, to be able to cast up to four votes per registered entity, and the town council would be an entity. Then the deadline to provide our roster is by September, and voting is in November. Um, it's a long online voting process, which I heard can take up to three hours to complete. Um, and there are videos and so on that can give guidance as to how to do it. Um, so for those who might have concerns about providing more hoops for developers and losing business to neighboring towns, et cetera, this would actually be a way to ensure that doesn't happen because we would be um, voting on the state energy code. Um, and so whatever we were voting on would be done across the board and wouldn't affect Amherst as opposed to neighboring communities. So uh, your mic. You, you need to push I move your the town of Amherst participate in voting on the International Energy Conservation Code. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Mandy Jo, okay, questions? Yes, Mandy Jo. Dorothy. Well, it's, it's, I, I read it over and it seemed very vague and it seemed to commit us to things that we didn't know what and I, it made me very worried and concerned about how it might impact all of our capital projects that we are trying to do. Mandy Jo? I, I guess this question might be to Councillor Schreiber, to Steve, because he's more of the planning board knowledge than I have. Um, the code that would be being voted on in November, I, is it a model code that then needs to be adopted by Massachusetts? Is it automatically adopted by Massachusetts? How does that process work? Yeah, so let me take a stab at that. And you, you Councilor Dumont might know more than I do. So I've been frantically uh, uh, looking. So there's a, something called the BBRS, which is a building, bo building, <laughs> building, B I know what one of the B stands for. It stands for building. <laughs> and I think the R, R stands for regulation and, and standards. Or, but the, that's basically the group that makes recommendations for building code changes. So what happens is that Massachusetts um, indeed has agreed that they will adopt the latest version of the energy code, but they can do it, with, as I understand it, with modifications. So I think it's you know, a good idea to try to influence the model code. Um, I'm new at this, so I, this is, to me this is an unusual way to be doing it because I understand, you know, more at the state level rather than on the town level. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea that towns or cities would be able to vote on this. So and I'm not prepared to, to, to vote simply because this is the first time I'm getting, you know, this information. So Steve, that raises a question that I have and that is I'm used to building codes like this being done at the state level yeah. and then passed down through the proper channels. And so my question really is, would the vote of this group be binding or would it be um, a recommendation? My understanding is that it's binding. It's that it's, yeah, it's an opportunity to vote on this international code, which is adopted by Massachusetts. And so whatever is voted on 
um, uh, well, it's adopted uh, internationally. So, and but Massachusetts has decided to use it as its base energy code. So, historically, not that many municipalities have weighed in on it. Um, and um, I think one staff person in Amherst weighed in the last time. And one staff person in Northampton weighed in the last time and this year because of this big push to get more people, more municipal participation, um, Northampton has now signed up for 20 votes. Um, they have the mayor's office, the planning department, the health department, the fire department, building department, all are separate municipal entities that can sign up and vote. So they have, because of this push that's been um, requested by Sierra Club and so on, a lot more municipalities are signing up in Massachusetts and then Massachusetts can have a lot more influence on this whole international code. I know it sounds strange, <laughs> um, but this is actually uh, the way it works. So. Um, George. So <clears throat> am I correct in understanding that the current state code, whatever it is, is has resulted from this already? Mm -hmm. That has happened. So we yes. are simply participating, or you're encouraging us to participate in a process that already is taking place in which we have no voice. But if we were to participate, we'd at least have a voice in it. Yes, that is, that is what I'm saying. Okay. Additional. Yes, Mandy Jo. I guess my next question is if we pass this, the council, it sounds like, would get four votes. But how do we determine what those votes are. If it's a three hour process and the council gets four votes and you have to designate four counselors, does each counselor get to decide how they're voting or is this going to be a full council decision that then says these, this is how you need to vote on each session? How, how is that? If we say we're going to use our four votes, how are we going to use our four votes and decide how we vote on the presumably separate parts of the code and separate changes and all. <coughs> Dorothy. No. Dorothy, I'm sorry. Uh, right now, all we need to do is decide that we, are, we will register. And then we can, uh, whoever is designated as the person who will register us, could just poll the group or through the president possibly just ask who would like to do this um, and we can get up to four for the town council steve yeah. yeah so you know again i'm new at this but it seems like um is this a legislative issue or is it an executive issue so we, let's say that we did that we all agree that this was the right process. Is this the right body to be the voters? So to me, it would seem like the building department, the planning department would be the, can you hear me or no? Yeah, okay. The, so, <coughs> and it's also not clear what we're voting on. So just like us, they, the, bo the body is required to have <coughs> public hearings on any proposed changes you know, to its model code. And so they're, I mean, so they have evidence both ways, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just like, and I, I, it's not that we're voting to increase the R value. It's a very complicated process, very, and so uh, I'm not positive we would be the right body to be participating this way. It may be a good idea for Amherst to be participating, but I'm not, certainly not, um, I, to me, it doesn't seem like a legislative action. Shalini. Has the town manager's office uh, uh, signed up for this or the planning board or the other? Um, I don't know. Mr. Bachman. We have not. Um, 
you, in order to participate, they require you to pay a fee to vote, and that just didn't seem right to me. Yeah. I'm, I have to go back to reading this and just say, when somebody says governmental member, to me that's a membership organization which then has the right to poll its members and in polling its members get a sense of what that membership would like them to do and that usually means that that body is also a registered lobbying agency it itself doesn't cannot bind the commonwealth or anybody else without the actions of the legislative body. So, I mean, I can be a member of any number of organizations, either personally or as a council. We could be members of organizations. We could vote to influence the way that organization would set its policies. And that policy would then be something that their lobbyists would move forward to governmental bodies with and the governmental bodies would have to, in this case, adopt the code. So I, I want to just be clear, I, this is not a binding vote. It can't be. The only people that can bind the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in a legislative way is the Great and General Court of Massachusetts. So it, there's nobody else that can set building code for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So, I mean, unless I didn't learn my government 101 properly. Steve. Yes, yes, Ish, and you know more about this than I do, but yeah. the, the general court can't adopt by reference right. other, other Oh, standards. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, but they can't, it can't be the, they can't they adopt it in whole. In other words, the people of Massachusetts have to have a say in their own, in their own laws. Right. Well, and, and if they're going to adopt a regulation that changes the code, then they usually put it out and they have hearings on it. And those hearings become public record. And then it's only after that that they actually then vote. Um, but they're the only ones that can bind the Commonwealth, and then we're the only ones that can bind the town of Amherst. Um, so I, I just want to be clear what I believe this is versus, and it doesn't mean that it's not there to influence an international code. That's absolutely what it's there for. But when we would vote as members of this body, it is to vote on the policies that this body would then take forward in its attempt to continue to influence legislative bodies that can in fact bind you. Just it's, it's the same way like the teachers union can have a position, but they can't bind us. They. That's not my understanding. Um, that's, I, I am quite sure that, that this IECC does, is adopted by Massachusetts as our base energy code. If so. it's adopted by Massachusetts as our base energy code, then there's somewhere in the laws of Massachusetts that say they have adopted this code as our base energy code. That, that, mean, that means, in fact, they have, the Great and General Court has bound us with that. Yes, Steve. I'm gonna read this up off the Mass, thank goodness for Google. I'm gonna read this off of um, Excellent. the Massachusetts, the MassGov uh, website, Energy Efficient Provisions of the State Building Code, 780 CMR, Commonwealth of Massachusetts regulations in accordance with the Green Communities Act of 2008, Massachusetts is required to update its billing code every three years to be consistent with the most recent. I actually am. Okay, so I should talk louder. Um, 
in, in accordance with the Green Communities Act of um, 2008, Massachusetts is required to update its billing code every three years to be consistent with the most recent version of the International Energy Conservation Code. Okay. So this, it, this is to then influence that code, which unless Massachusetts changes its mind, it would adopt. But I, I just, it's a fine line, Darcy, but all they can do is influence the code. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts could decide to no longer endorse that code. They could reverse their law, just the way we could reverse our position on something. So the, the, the request is, do we as a council want to vote to have the opportunity to have four delegates vote on this law or this position which can at, at least in the past continues to influence the Massachusetts building code correct am I is that helpful okay so the motion's been made and seconded are there further discussion Are there further points? George. It's late, I know, but I, it just, I, I like the idea of us being participating in the conversation, um, which I think is what uh, Darcy is proposing. It seems like a good idea. Um, the state clearly does take it seriously. The, uh, what Steve has read makes that point as well. But I just wonder whether the, any one of us or four of us really has the relevant expertise uh, to really contribute to this in a, an appropriate way. Um, it seems that this would be more appropriate for people who have an expertise in specific areas of code. Um, I can't imagine any one of us having the time um, to become, come up to speed. Now, maybe the ECAC would take this on, um, but that they've had a lot to do too. So um, that's my reservation. Is it's just mm -hmm. I like the idea of being a participant in the conversation. It's clear that this does have some impact, whatever it may be. Um, but I, I question what relevance, what expertise we bring to this how we could really be a contributor. And Joe. Alyssa would like to comment. Thank you. I would, I will, if when we come to a vote, I will vote no on this, but I'm wondering if there's a possibility of referring it to the town manager for additional information. I realize that won't meet the deadline, but I know, and I know he already gave an answer, but I think we would all be better informed by the building commissioner, for example, reporting back in you know two or three sentences why we haven't done this in the past or why he thinks it would be a really great idea for us to do it in the future. Are there other comments? <laughs> okay, then hearing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Councillor Pam? No. I'm sorry. Hold on. Can you, what are we voting on? <laughs> we are voting on the motion for the town of Amherst to participate in voting on the International Energy Conservation Code. Okay. Councillor Pam? No. Councillor Ryan? No. Councillor Shane? No. Councillor Schreiber? No. Councillor Steinberg? No. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Baumilne? No. Councillor Brewer? No. Councillor DeAngelis? No. Councillor Dumont? Yes, and I'm amazed. I'm totally amazed. Councillor Grismer? No. Councillor Haneke? No. We have 11 to 1. I'm sorry, 1 to 11. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are moving on to eight, which is the committee reports. I believe, if I'm correct, the Finance Committee and the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee have submitted written reports. The other committees may wish to make brief oral reports. Um, uh, so, Andy, we'll start with finance. 
be, I'll be very brief right now, and uh, then uh, if you have questions, uh, we can rather handle it that way. I think the report speaks for itself. Um, the major part of the report I'll speak to first, which is that uh, we spent uh, and are continuing to spend considerable time looking at the major capital projects with the questions of whether uh, the town can create a path to go forward with the major, uh, with all of the major projects or what compromises would need to be made either in what is proposed or um, in the timeline in order to achieve that result. Uh, it makes reference in there that we expected to soon receive a beta test version that the committee can work with to start looking at um, the variables ourselves and go beyond um, the introductory piece that was presented. That has been received today. Um, Mr. Mangano provided that to the committee. So, but we haven't had a chance, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. There's too much else going on today. Yeah. Um, so that's, and, and the part that's in mm -hmm. there regarding uh, the school options, uh, because of the uh, vote coming up on April 1st, uh, we uh, picked out that particular section and uh, presented that information to you to help inform your discussion. I think that what is uh, the, the obvious conclusion is, is that the uh, most affordable uh, plans are to move forward with the two school option, regardless of, um, there were several three school options that were done. The three school options are assuming that for all of them that we want to get and move forward and get something done to replace the buildings as quickly as possible. And if so, uh, where are we, where do we stand financially in moving forward with three, three buildings or two buildings? Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to mention was the uh, regional school budget process. And uh, it speaks to itself there, so I don't need to go into it much. We encourage as a um, finance committee that all of the council um, attend the a April 4th budget hearing when the superintendent will present the budget. Um, it is not a forum, it is a hearing. Therefore, there are no time constraints as there were at the forum. And uh, the, the council, um, councilors who are able to attend will have full opportunity without time constraints to ask whatever questions that they may have um, that kind of education will help both the council and the finance committee move forward and might enable us to um, have the council then vote on the budget on the earlier date we originally talked about and not have to require the additional meeting. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Um, let the, um, and I don't know if uh, my vice chair has anything to add. No. Any questions? Yes, Pat. The report talks about um, options for, that they're for illustrative uh, purposes, uh, but the model is, as it's developed assumes substantial belt tightening with annual capital outlays for other needs at half the current levels, the modeling assumes that other capital expenses will be budgeted at 2.5 million annually. This would restrict what is available for roads, sidewalks, et cetera. Um, and is this realistic? That's one question. I mean. Um, I, th I think you're asking exactly the right question because the way this will, and we're gonna be testing it, if you say not realistic and say, we should continue at at least 80% or 90%. What you'll see is we have fewer dollars to finance a bond issue. So one of the purposes of this is to do a reality check 
on what are the flow of it is. And it's exactly that kind of question, Pat. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're talking here about the uh, debit, debt exclusion override. Is there any place in the model f uh, when that's removed? I mean, that's certainly okay. So that that because it, it doesn't say that. So I really think we need to see it's, what it. It's the, the same thing that if you take that off and you're trying to finance it internally, you go whoops. You know, we're down to one project. So it it, it lets you see. Um, choose which, if any, do a debt service override, and then look at what happens to our ability t to pay for it. Thank you. Dorothy. Um, I just want to draw your attention to on page three, um, where the um, maximum annual tax for debt exclusion, the second bottom line is the average annual tax. And I, I just wanted to comment that I don't think that's how people would see it. They would see what it was when it first came on, when it's high, the fact that it gets lower over time. Um, I, I think that we have to look at the top number, but that's what the impact will be on residents when they get that tax bill. But there was a, a question I had, um, a, a <coughs> sentence in here that I don't remember hearing about. This is on page two right after the section that Pat referred to, which talks about belt tightening and less money to fix things, is a paragraph that says, of course, to the extent expanded state funds become available to support and pay for infrastructure roads and help finance renovations or green climate investment, including solar panels, the forecasted scenarios would change. And I, w I would love to hear more about those um, possibilities of expanded state funds. Um, let me just say that if you follow, first of all, there's been a lot of talk about additional transportation infrastructure funds, uh, both at the federal, believe it or not, and state level. And at the state level, there's also been an introduction of a 10-year-long bill uh, that would start looking at financing some of the kinds of things we've been talking here. So there, where the hope would be and, and, and that's just scratching the surface. The hope would be that the realization that we have crumbling infrastructure and at the same time a need to be much more environmentally sound has risen at least to the state of Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Paul, you may have more to say about that. It's something we actually, as Paul and I have had the opportunity to meet with uh, Representative Mindy Dom, we have asked that we keep track on all of that kind of stuff, particularly the climate stuff. Angie. Yeah, as far as the debt exclusion override question is concerned, um, I guess that I look at it uh, whether we, for those of us who lived in Massachusetts in 1980 when uh, Proposition Two was uh, that year was passed, and uh, the good things and the bad things that have happened with Proposition Two, it was in the end um, a democratic process that was created, and uh, because of the tax limits that are in there, it, it makes it, as was previously noted, limited as to what. A community can afford to build in the way of infrastructure projects without um, going over the regular proposition two and a half limits. The purpose of a debt exclusion override is in part um, to go back to the voters and let the voters make a decision as to how much they value the project. Um, the decision, as noted elsewhere in the report, is to whether to place something into a debt exclusion override is ultimately a decision of this council. And uh, so whether to place it on and for which projects will be a discussion that we would have at a future date if we move forward in that direction. Uh, but there is, uh, um, for all of the reasons explained, uh, no way that we could move forward 
and meet the uh, backlog of infrastructure needs that have been identified for a long time in this community without um, at least giving the voters the opportunity to make that decision after we educate ourselves and then um, the voters become educated on the costs and benefits that would be there. The other thing I'd just like to emphasize, and that is the um, beta version of this um, has been made available to the Finance Committee. Um, we will be testing it out over the next couple weeks, asking for any changes that we need to be, we think need to be made available, and then it will be made available to the full council um, and eventually be online for the public. Um, and it's an opportunity for people to then play out various scenarios. And that is building on the presentation that Sean Magano has given to us uh, once in this meeting and several times now for finance. Yeah. Okay. And I want to just thank Andy for the time spent on this report. I know it was extraordinary and um, very, very demanding. Um, anything else? Uh, Alyssa, or do you want your vice chair to report on the Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee? That would be fine. Kathy? Okay, we, we do not have a written report, but mm -hmm. we have a very ambitious timeline um, where we've started drafting sections um, we did have an initial discussion on the issue that was referred to us that you asked to refer back on the whole question of liaisons mm -hmm. and council liaisons. And uh, uh, Alyssa was not able to be at that meeting, so we want to have one more meeting, which is tomorrow, on a first coming up with a list of which committees we think are vital mm -hmm. to have it and what the process would be. But we, we work through a series of pretty succinct how we might handle that, and we'll be bring, we should be able to bring that back. And okay. the rest of it is um, we will deliver a report. <laughs> but we're on a very tight timeline to get it back to you. Right. And as my recommendation back to you and my request has been that on the meeting in May that is the second meeting, um, I can't come up with the exact date, we would be looking at the proposed rules and that we would be prepared to d adopt them on June 3rd. And the only reason we can go to June 3rd is because June 2nd, which is the deadline, is actually a Sunday. So. That nice. Yeah. Uh, you know, and one of the issues that we'll, we'll discuss in our meetings tomorrow is there some things that are just going to be straightforward, like we already have an agenda. Mm -hmm. This is our agenda. There, but there's some things that might be new ideas, and do we want to do them mm -hmm. here um, that will be worth focusing more rather than less attention on it, uh, assuming it's written lucidly? Okay. Sarah. Oh, are there any questions? Sarah? Yep. So um, Oka did not give you a written report for tonight, but I absolutely definitely will. Um, and I just, I'm gonna do this really fast because you don't have a bunch of supporting documents in, in front of you. Um, today at our meeting, we did take a vote on a decision tree as a practice to start to um, be able to have OCA interview um, people for multi-member bodies and, and bring them forward. We did hear from the Attorney General today on a phone call that, um, I'm sorry, from Lauren today, that the Attorney General has not gotten back to us on absolutely is that legal. But we, we did say we found one we really like. <laughs> um, so for us, that was a step forward. Um, we, I have asked um, verbally to Lynn, who was at our meeting today, and to Paul, um, if we could maybe just send an SOS out to Lauren and say, please, if you possibly could, do you think we could try to get the Attorney General to weigh in by April 2nd? And the reason why we would like that is because if we're going to do interviews and bring people back to you, then we would have to try to get that ruling by April 2nd. 
and then start interviews quickly thereafter so that we can bring the designee could bring names back to OCA by May 6th and then we could bring them to you town council for ratification on May 20th but it would give people a few weeks in there to say I hate this please go back and look at other names so when we have more information on that then we're going to I'm going to write out that report and give you all that information um, we also just made the great jump that one of us would be designated to do interviews if our process is adopted um, after we hear back from the Attorney General and that would be the chair now again that's if that gets a lawful okay um, small print and a large headache um, So I think the only other exciting things that we did was that we did decide to meet eight times between 325 to 520 um, to make sure that we get all of our work done. And we had our first subcommittee meeting of outreach and communications, and we had, we had Paul with us to talk about how the role of outreach with the resident advisory committee. We also had two of our three community participation officers there, and we all very much talked about what we thought each committee's outreach purview should be so that we're not stepping on toes but we're also supporting each other and I want to say the community participation officers have been working incredibly hard and I think in your packet you had a lot of the materials that they've already um, put forward to us um, like how to plan for a subcommittee or ad hoc meeting um, plan for district meeting or office hours um, this is, they've already done an incredible amount um, to try to help, up, help process. Um, their feeling from what I understood today was that um, OCA would basically be helping with counselor to counselor communications and also that we would be helping to um, support district meetings, um, larger meetings and we also discussed um, what our role would be in, in making sure that we were bringing um, constituents um, in for some of the larger, larger meetings, the hearings, the budget forums. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Did I? Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, governance organization legislation, Mandy Jo. So it's all pretty much in the report. Um, so I just want to bring up two things. One is a recommendation that we are making that will come up at a future council meeting on um, to the council about committees and themselves reviewing their charges. Because it's not up for a vote tonight, I don't believe we need to discuss it tonight, but I want to say that was put forth from and referred up to the town council and I'll work with our president to figure out when it is best to have that as a discussion and action item on an agenda. And then I just wanted to highlight the public ways discussion that the GOL had had and is continuing to have per the referral from the council and we've made it through and a couple of items and I put in the report where our preliminary decisions have been made we will continue those next week and discussions next week if anyone has feedback on those at this time they can contact me and I'll take it to the committee <coughs> or you could bring it you could come to a committee meeting and make a comment um, but I thought I'd put out the preliminary decisions so people could see where we were headed on that yeah okay yes I have Dorothy. one comment <clears throat> on the parking a place one when you say 31 or more days, um, don't you need to include some words like um, consecutive or non-consecutive or in total or time period? We will be. Um, the decision was that they would be cumulative. That was a preliminary decision made. Um, so that, that would end up when we get a full report back. We'll make sure that language is in there, but we had discussed whether it would be consecutive or cumulative, and at this point, we're looking at cumulative reservations. Okay. Yes, Dorsey. Um, 
And I just had a question. The, the public way issue, that's going to come back as an action item? Yes, when we're ready, yep. And I also wondered about the language at the beginning of your memo about clarity, about how the GOL committee is going to be the ultimate arbiter of whether a measure is clear. <laughs> Just wondering if any committee can be the ultimate arbiter of anything. So what we would report back out would be whether we declared it clear or not as we reported back out with the um, two committee charges tonight that the council, you know, the committee declared something clear, consistent, and actionable. If for some reason we declare it not, we would report out, we, we, did, we voted whatever to declare or not declare it clear, whichever potential one it would be. And then we would report where our issues were. Our goal is to always work with sponsors if we've got concerns like that to see if we can work with them to come up with language that would satisfy our guidelines for clear, consistent, and actionable that would also be supported by sponsors. But it would be reported out for the town council to make a final decision on it, even if it goes against the committee's declaration. Just wondered about that language. Further questions, Pat? I don't have a question. I have a correction on the guidelines for review of bylaws that was attached uh, under actionable uh, in the last part of the sentence. Uh, um, Accord, not in conflict with Mass General Law, the Amherst Home Rule Charter, comma, or any other law, comma, bylaw, but there's an R in there after. That's a Mandy Joe. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Yes, Sarah. Just a question for when Goal is going through um, charges of committees, if something is. Um, Perhaps it's, if pieces are perhaps taken out of the charge, like as you discuss things, you think it might be placed somewhere else, will that that'll be part of your report? Would that be something that the entire council would vote on, or would it be that you've done the work and that, that it should stand that way? So I think the way GOL has been operating, if we refer to, say, our CRC charge that we adopted tonight, we would report out with a tracked change version that shows everything that was changed. And then that's the motion that would go in. And then the town council could decide to add anything back in or change anything or anything like that. But I, I think our goal is to always report out clearly what changes we have made after it came to us. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Okay. Is there any um, comment uh, regarding bylaw review committee? Pat, I believe you're the only council person here. I was not present at, present at the last meeting. Okay. Then I think we'll just skip off, skip over that one. Unless Alyssa, you had a comment? We're doing fine. Great. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, the Council Goals and Values Statement um, Ad Hoc Committee. We've met once. We have two more scheduled meetings. Um, we actually are not looking at the, vo at the values. We're looking at the goals, the Town Council goals. Um, we have two more meetings scheduled, and we hope that to be able to bring to the Council a set of recommended goals, including activities, timelines, and responsibilities by our April 22nd meeting. Okay? If anybody wants to join us, we're meeting on Fridays at 4 o'clock. <laughs> it's the only time we could find. Any further comments on that? Okay. Uh, we've already done citations. We're moving on to minutes. Can I ask a question? Can we do all the minutes in one vote? Excellent. I'm going to ask the following. Are there any changes to the minutes of February 25th? 
Okay, are there any changes to the minutes of March 2nd, the four towns meeting? Any changes to the minutes of March 4th? Any change to the minutes of March 7th, the budget form? Do I hear a motion to uh, approve? I actually have a point of order. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, we weren't all at the, the, uh, the presences were different mm -hmm. for all of these meetings. Right. So normally the normal practice is to abstain if you weren't there. Actually, the other day when we were with Lauren, she said that is not necessary okay. to abstain. It was a very interesting that you bring that up. Um, okay, I'm hearing no changes in these, and so I'm going to make a motion that we approve the minutes of February 25, March 2nd, March 4, and March 7, 2019. Do I hear a second? Okay. Shane, Kathy Shane gets the second this time. Um, any further conversation? Uh, we must take a roll call vote. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Abstain. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Abstain. Councillor Griesemer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. And Councillor Pam? Yes. And I do want to say for the record, I read through every one of them, and they were excellent. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's 10 too. Thank you. OK, we're moving on to the town manager's report. Thank you. Um, you have my written report, so I'm not going to reiterate that. I do want to note a few things. One is the. Um, Hampshire College. We're continuing to monitor the situation at Hampshire. Um, there, the town is feeling the impact of the announcements that they've made to date. In essence, they have reduced their, they've eliminated their um, security into a s smaller security system, which uh, means that our police department may be required to respond um, that they otherwise wouldn't be, but we have not experienced that yet. Also, we've made a uh, disclosure um, to our bondholders that one of our major employers may be reducing their footprint in terms of employment and that in case that, that they deem that to be material. So there are real things that are happening to the town. Uh, and so we have been working with our state representative and uh, contacted our um, neighbors in Hadley and are continuing to work through this and we'll keep you updated as that moves forward. Um, community participation officers uh, attending district meetings and had really good meeting this morning with uh, OCA and their subcommittee and I just one thing I want to add is that what was very clear is that the counselors are the front lines in terms of making connections with people you're out in the field you're talking to people your neighbors your friends and uh, in terms of engaging people uh, in terms of wanting to participate in lots of different ways, not just serving on committees, but in lots of different ways. And uh, so we hope to <coughs> continue to support that. Um, we have our Kanagasaki visitors coming this week. They'll be here Wednesday at four o'clock with a br very brief sort of welcome ceremony here. Uh, and then they go off and go to their homestays. Um, public safety, very proud of our police department for receiving accreditation. And uh, as we um, complete as the students come back from their spring break at UMass, uh, we anticipate the next few weekends to be busy weekends uh, uh, in terms of activity, and we will be staffing up to make sure that we're, the town is protected and we handle all the situations. Um, there, the uh, tree department will be doing some tree on a tree on the town common next to the Merry Maple. They will be removing a tree. People will probably be alarmed by that, but they shouldn't be. Well, maybe they will. They should be if they want to. But, um, <laughs> but it, it's not the Merry Maple. They will be evaluating. Since they have the equipment there, they will be evaluating the Merry Maple, uh, maybe doing some um, trimming of the Merry Maple. Uh, but 
the tree that they're taking down is one that needs to be cut, that needs to come down. But we anticipate having some calls on that. Um, the Station Road Bridge, uh, we have received some feedback from the state. We still are waiting from three agent, three different uh, divisions in Boston. With the comments we have, we've been working on uh, redoing the design. Our initial goal, which was ambitious to get the bridge up and um, operational by the end of April, is clearly not going to be met. Um, I hesitate to put a new date on it because we are at the mercy of the state to get all of their feedback. So that's a little frustrating um, on our end. Uh, we continue to work with the, um, uh, we're hoping that we can continue to do, get a design that does not require us to go through our environmental permitting again. And um, we are, to that end, we are seeking, uh, continuing, continuing with uh, procurement activities to secure a bridge that might meet all the requirements that the state is putting on us. Um, so, and uh, just, uh, you know, we've been remiss in not updating our website and we will do that in the next day or two and get this information plus any other information we have up on the website because I think we've fallen down on that and we owe that to the neighbors and everybody who's concerned about the bridge. Um, one other thing was the uh, kudos to the LSSC. They have been awarded the agency award for the department's recreational program outreach. Um, they have done really exceptional and innovative work around recreational programs. A year ago, we really encouraged them to start doing programming in um, areas where people are living instead of waiting for people to come to our parks. And they've done that and had a very high success rate uh, when they do programming where children are living, basically and during the summer, and that's been a really, um, really good thing for the department and for the uh, people of Amherst, and just kudos to them for taking that on. And, oh, uh, one, uh, David Burgess came in today and announced that his, he's going, our principal assessor, he'll be retiring uh, coming in July. So um, we will be working with him for uh, a succession plan and where we will be going with that. Um, and so he might still be available to us after his retirement on a part-time basis, which would be very beneficial to the town. Um, but David is a genius. I mean, and I don't use that word lightly. He really knows assessing and it's a complicated world and he nails it with great confidence uh, on a regular basis and is able to handle complex um, analysis of um, uh, different of, of the assessment methods, especially as we get more commercial properties and more com complex properties that he has to evaluate. Um, so he, but he's, he's a real leader in his field. So we'll have more time with him, but um, just a, that, that's a big hole for us to fill, but I'm pretty confident and he is confident that we'll be able to manage through this process. So that's a summary of my report. Okay. Yes, question. Station Road Bridge. Um, I know way back when there was talk of potentially putting out a RFP or request for bids while the state stuff was ongoing. Has, I don't, I don't know what the outcome of that was. Is there an RFP out now, I'm guessing, when I'm in, or are we going to be waiting for all the state stuff to come back until we put that out? So we've determined that an RFP is not necessary, that we can buy this as a structure. And so we can, if it's under $50,000 for the actual structure uninstalled, um, it's not, no more different, it's no different than buying a tractor trailer or something like that. So we're looking at it in that way and seeing if we can, um, and our procurement officials think that that's an appropriate way to do it as long as it's under $50,000 and we're hopeful. So that gives us the opportunity to engage with bridge makers, tell them what we're looking for and see what What's really important is the profile of the bridge, how high um, up off of, away from the water it is. That's the critical piece at this moment in time. So we, okay. have, and just, we have two quotes in. I think we're look, trying to get a third and fourth quote later this week. Okay. Other additional questions? Shalini. I have a question about the, the community participation officers and just generally 
when we're thinking of reaching out to underrepresented com communities, uh, underrepresentative, underrepresented communities, who's, I mean, who, under whose purview is that work? Is it the district counselors, is it the OCA community, and the OCA or the, C the community participants? Oh, I'm yeah, tired. We say CPOs. <laughs> CPOs. So yeah, and who's doing that part of reaching out to those communities? I, I don't think there's any exclusivity to that mm -hmm. work. I think that's work that everybody should be embodying. Uh, the CPOs in particular, I know, are really concentrating in that area on multiple levels. And it, part of it is, you know, we th I think in terms of committee appointments, but they have a much broader concept. And that includes, are you willing to be a coach of a basketball team? Are you able to host a block party in your neighborhood? There's lots of different ways. Will you come to a neighborhood cleanup event for us? Um, so there's, they think, they look at it much more broadly because there's lots of different ways to engage people in the community. It's not just by serving on a committee. And a lot of people, that's the last thing they want to do. Um, uh, so I think that uh, they have a much broader view of that. Can I just add a follow-up thing to that? Oops. So one of the roles they could be playing, like I just heard the LSSE, for example, they're reaching out and creating those things. So if the district counselors in that area know about these activities, then if we can coordinate and find ways to, yeah, be there. So I tried to be really brief so I didn't get into all of this, but yeah, that's definitely, I asked today when, I mean, they had fabulous ideas and I said, could we please get the list of all these fabulous things that you're thinking of doing. So we are all going to be on the, the front lines. So um, community participation officers will give us some information. We'll make sure that all of the counselors get the information. We also talked a little bit about things like um, showing people what the um, community activity forms look like. And then when we're having like office hours or district meetings, perhaps bringing our laptops with us because not everyone has a computer so that we could help people if they wanted to fill one out, that we could help them do that. Or we could help them like get to the library and figure out if you want to use the, you know, the computer all the time. Um, could you do that? So I wanted to make my report really brief, but I'll make sure that when it's written, it's more detailed and then we'll get much more information out to you. Great. Any further questions? Okay, uh, then we're moving on to the town council comments. Um, let me just share two sets of comments. Uh, as president, uh, first of all, I will be polling you as I did before to determine people's interest in the resource committee, the audit committee, and the ECAC. However, let me split the three apart. Resource committee and audit, one is five people, the other one's three. Those I will be polling and reporting back to you in a comprehensive spreadsheet so that you get a sense of the spread of counselors across committees. And uh, with that will come an, a memo to you appointing people to those two committees since they are committees of the council. For the ECAC, all I'm doing is polling so that I can forward to the town manager the people who are interested in ECAC from the town council. There will be no priority on that or no opinion of the council. Okay? Questions on that? My goal is to do all of that and come back on April 1st with those appointments. Um, the second thing is you do have a letter from Senator Comfort Comerford um, and uh, again complimenting Amherst on our striving to can grow and develop our net zero uh, energy code uh, and including the fact that she refers to a bill that she's signed on to as the Amherst bill. Um, right. On, let's move on to future agenda items. Um, I've already mentioned what will be on the April 1st agenda and uh, are there other ones that people would like to make sure that we include as future agenda items? 
I believe we mentioned marijuana last time. And I've had two constituents ask that we look at the um, state of recycling in Amherst because of the international and national trends that are unfortunately happening with recycling. Yes, Andy Joe. Alyssa's got a comment, I believe. Just in terms of a future agenda item? Yes. The uh, CRAN, the Citizens for Racial Amity Now, who worked with town meeting and the select board in the past for the second Sunday in June to be recognized as Race Amity Day, would like to come to our meeting based on our schedule and based on their schedules on April 22nd to present that resolution for the second Sunday in June. And they'll send us the resolution in advance. Yes, but they were thinking, yes, definitely, and a flyer as well associated with the events in June. But it worked out better for them to do it on April 22nd than at one of our May meetings. Thank you. There is also going to be a resolution from the Amherst Education Foundation on the event of their 25th anniversary. Right. Are there other questions or comments at this time? All right, counselor comments. Yes. Uh, just in reference to the um, Comerford letter, um, where the bill is called the Amherst Bill, I think that um, we should all acknowledge the big role that Darcy has played in bringing Amherst to the forefront of um, an energy conscious town. Great. Thank you. Actually, we had other counselors here that participated in that zero energy effort. Lynn and Andy. I think that's it, right? <laughs> yeah. And also the members of a group that you work very closely with, Mothers Out Front. Okay, anything else? Councilor comments? Topics not reasonably anticipated? No executive session? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second. Pat moved it. And Mandy Jo seconded. This is a roll call vote. <laughs> oh, no way. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. That's 12. I don't get it. Thank vote. you. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs>